Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to call to order our City Council meeting for tonight, September 25th, 2023. Thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. We always start our council meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance, but on nights when we have a special night like tonight when we're swearing in new police officers, we always have the honor of having the honor guard post the colors and then lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'm going to turn it over to Chief Hodges and let him lead us through this, and then we will uh, stand for the pledge. Thank you. Can, you can be seated now. That is always such a pleasure to have the color guard bringing the colors. So thank you so much to the color guard. Thanks for our uh, police department for making that uh, entire uh, unit a reality and, and doing that. It really adds a lot to our council meetings and to other official business we have here at the city of Bloomington. Once again, uh, welcome to everybody here in the chambers and everyone watching online tonight. We have a, an interesting agenda tonight, and our first order of business is to approve that agenda. In the agenda this evening, under our introductory items, which is item number two, first off, we're going to have the swearing-in of our new Bloomington police officers and an introduction of new Bloomington Police Department employees, and then recognition of a gift by Rex and Julie Mirapiri from Mirapiri Gallery. So good to see you here this evening. Looking forward to that. Item 2.2 .2 is uh, uh, a second uh, introduction and acknowledgement of a donation, and this by our friends from the Bloomington Lions Club. Great to see so many of the Lions here this evening. Thank you for being here as well. We will have an introduction of other new city employees. We're going to have a Hennepin County update from our Hennepin County Commissioner. Debbie Gattel is here with us this evening. Good evening, Commissioner. Thank you for being here. And then we're going to have a presentation about the 2023 National Community Survey, an annual survey that we do of residents to see how we're doing here in the city of Bloomington. Diane Kirby will be presenting that for us. Uh, that's item 2.5. Our consent business is uh, 10 items long, and Councilmember D'Alessandro has our consent business this evening. Under item 4, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, we will have a public hearing regarding some amendments to our earned sick and safe leave time code, and uh, that will be a discussion we have under item 4. We'll move to item 5, our organizational business. We'll have an update on our opportunity housing ordinance, uh, an update and a discussion on the 102nd Street traffic and school safety uh, plans and work that has, gone un uh, gone, has been underway for a while. And item 5.3, we will wrap up this evening with our city council policy and issue update. Council, any questions, additions, subtractions, anything regarding our agenda this evening? If not, I would move tonight's agenda as stated. Second. We've got a motion and a second to accept tonight's agenda as stated. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0, and we have an official agenda. Thank you. Item 2.1 on that agenda is the swearing in of our new Bloomington Police Department officers. Chief Hodges, there he is, I didn't see him there. 
Good evening, Chief. Welcome. The floor is yours. Uh, Mayor and Council, uh, we're, we switched up the order. So first we're going to do the civilians first and then the police officers, if that's... Chief, we have an agenda. I mean, oh. come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me know if I, you know, one of you guys want to second my we're good. authorized yeah. motion over here. Um, all right. <laughs> so uh, first, uh, we're going to start off with our cadets. And for many people who may be watching this in Bloomington, we have a cadet program here where those who are going to school to be police officers get to come work for the police department while they're uh, getting their training. Uh, so they do a lot of stuff for us, such as animal control and a lot of other duties around the police department. So this is a great program. And uh, the next group of officers after this group we swear in, you'll see we actually hired three of our cadets to be police officers. This program is one of the programs that allows us to continue to be full, fully staffed and stay ahead of the curve where a lot of other agencies are struggling to hire people. This is one of the programs that are helpful for that. So with that, first, we'll get started off with uh, Jeremy. So you're going to come up here and just tell, I got a little script for you right here, man, so get, get used to reading. <laughs> Mayor, City Council, City Manager, uh, my name is Jeremy Morrison. Um, uh, I grew up here in Bloomington, and I'm currently taking law enforcement classes at Normandale. And I came from uh, Sam's Club, and I graduated from Jefferson. So I guess you can say I really like it here in Bloomington. Thank you. Welcome aboard, Jeremy. Welcome. And you can see why we hired him. I mean, the amount of energy that he has. Whole. <laughs> I thought I had some energy. Huh? <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, we'll bring up uh, Gabriel. Uh, Mayor. City Manager, City Council, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Gabriel Morales. I'm originally from Los Angeles, California, so unfortunately that makes me a Dodgers fan. Um, I grew up also in like the south side of Minneapolis. I'm currently at Normandale Community College working on my degree. I'm coming from the Mall of America. been working there for the past five years. I've gotten to know the Bloomington Police Department pretty well. That's why I'm here now. Um, thank you. Thank you. Welcome aboard. And one of the things you'll start to notice is uh, we're formalizing a partnership with the mall to, again, to stay ahead of our recruitment efforts and to help them also. So next is uh, Jocelyn. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, and City Manager. My name is Jocelyn Bader. I grew up in Minnetonka, Minnesota, although I was adopted from South Korea. Um, I graduated with my degree in criminal justice from University of Northwestern St. Paul. I'm currently getting my law enforcement certification from Hennepin Technical College and I'm planning on taking my post exam this May. Um, I came from uh, the Minnetonka Police Department as a community service officer. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Jocelyn. Thanks for being with us this evening. And Jocelyn was one of my students at Northwestern. What grade did you get in my class? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, next, uh, one of our newest uh, public safety telecommunicators, uh, Allie. Mayor, City Council, City Manager. My name is Allie Hogan. Uh, I actually grew up in St. Paul. I now live in Woodbury, and I uh, actually work at Lifetime Fitness in the child care, and I decided I needed a little bit more to do. So now I'm here in public, in public safety. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Allie. Welcome. And she's doing a phenomenal job. Um, you know, when we normally have people that come into our dispatch center who don't have any of that type of experience, we always worry a little bit, but she is doing phenomenal. So I know she's going to be great once she's done with her training. So next, and I haven't met him yet because um, I was busy this morning getting my teeth cleaned uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, James who's one of our part-time uh, radio technician oh how you doing man nice to meet you, <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, <laughs> uh, hello mayor uh, good evening um, my name is uh, James Hokaug uh, I graduated from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design uh, last year and started doing a lot of film. I do uh, meetings for uh, Minnetonka, Deep Haven, Excelsior, 
uh, police department and fire district. I'm the man behind the camera, and usually I'd look through the camera and see the guest speaker right here at one of these desks, and I'd think, man, he always looks so nervous. <laughs> and I always laughed at it behind the camera, but uh, now I know why he was nervous. So <laughs> thank you guys so much. Thank you, James. Welcome. Welcome aboard. All right, I'm going to move on to our sworn police officers, and I just give my quick spiel here. Uh, the officers you're going to see today have already completed their training. They've already been through our academy, and they are working the street right now. And one of the things I changed when I became chief is I wanted to bring people before you after they completed their training. So you see them. These are fully-fledged police officers, and they're out working the street. Uh, at Bloomington Police Department, our core value is respect, as we all know. And our mission statement is respect demonstrated through our compassionate, honest service. And each one of you are expected to exemplify that every day. And I already know you've done that. You've already got my lecture when you started day one. And uh, someday, maybe one of you guys can be sitting here wearing these stars giving that same lecture. So with that, I'm going to bring up Officer Ryan Brown. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Manager. My name is Ryan Brown. I grew up in Cottage Grove here in Minnesota. I have an associate's degree from the Alexandria Technical College. <laughs> and prior to coming here, I've been a police officer for 12 years, with the last eight of those at the Woodbury Police Department. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. So Ryan's a glutton for punishment. Um, this is his second go-round with me. Um, he worked. He and I worked together in Dakota County. I was, back when I was a real cop, the, uh, I was a sergeant, so he worked for me there. So he's going to do great here. Next up is another Ryan, uh, Officer Ryan McCreary. Good evening. <clears throat> like Chief said, I'm another Ryan. Ryan McCreary, some would say the better-looking one. Um, I grew up in Bloomington, so being here to serve the community that I grew up in is uh, an honor. I actually got an exercise sports science degree from UWL Lacrosse, Wisconsin, and then lo and behold, I did a little bit of training, and I figured this is a better career for me. So made the switch. Glad to be here. Thank you, Officer McCray. Welcome. You know, when he came to the interview, we didn't have to ask what he did. For 11. It's like he works out. Okay, you got it. Right. So uh, next up is uh, Cedric, uh, Officer Cedric Okoy. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Manager. My name is Cedric Okoy. Um, I graduated from Concordia, St. Paul, uh, with my master's in criminal justice leadership. I got my bachelor's in criminal justice, and I got my law enforcement certificate certificate from. Uh, hit up in tech, going through the Pathways program. Uh, prior to this, I worked for Ramsey County part-time for 10 years at a, as a correctional officer, and I worked full-time eight years for Hennepin County, most of that time as a social worker. Um, I'm here now, and I'm really proud to be here, so thank you for the opportunity. We're happy to have you. Welcome. So I, I can tell you, uh, I knew we made the right pick when we picked Cedric. Um, Obviously, you know, I'm in the community a lot, and when I have community members who were former um, visitors to correctional institutions um, tell me that they remember him and how well he treated them, I knew that we made the right pick. So all three of these guys are going to do well. Um, so with that, uh, who's doing oath of office? All right. All right, city clerk, Christina Scipioni is going to come up. We will be doing the oath of office, and this is... Uh, what I typically tell family members now, this is going to happen once. So don't be shy about getting into good camera position. And you can get up, you can come forward. Hold on, Christina, let's, let's, let's give people a chance. Come on up. <laughs> come on up. You're, uh, you're, you're welcome to stand wherever you need to stand to get the best picture possible. Because like I said, you get one shot at this. I think we're good to go. All right. Please raise your right hand and state your first and last name. Ryan Brown. Ryan McCrary. Cedric O'Coy. Repeat after me. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the state of Minnesota. And the state of Minnesota. And will faithfully discharge the duties. 
and will faithfully discharge the duties of a police officer of a police officer for the city of Bloomington, Minnesota for the city of Bloomington, Minnesota to the best of my judgment and ability to the best of my judgment and ability congratulations Take this picture for us. Right. I mean, they look better to me today. <laughs> I do freshly got a, I do got a broke arm. Though. Thing you get your teeth clean, Chief, for the picture. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank Well, to our new officers, congratulations and welcome uh, to their families. Thank you so very much for sharing them with us. Uh, it's going to be a busy time over the next couple of years. And to the rest of our officers, I'm glad uh, to have you welcoming them all on board and uh, making them part of the Bloomington Police family. As, uh, as we say at this time, uh, you folks are the face so often, you're, you're the face of Bloomington so, for so many people. And we appreciate the work that you do, the respect that you give to our residents. Uh, the outstanding police work that you do every single day, and how you reflect Bloomington to the people who work, play, visit, shop in this city. So thank you all so very much. Now I understand you've got a, uh, a reception after this, so we'll, we'll understand that and we'll wait for you to clear up. But in the meantime, but before that, I know we have a presentation of, uh, a special presentation of an art piece. And I believe, uh, Chief, are you uh -huh. going to talk to us about this as well? <laughs> okay, um, so Rex and Julie gave us this, uh, or it was a gift to the police department, and uh, we are glad to have it. Um, normally when people want to donate a piece of art it's kind of tricky especially for a law enforcement agency but the meaning behind this was something that um, meant so much to me and the department personally because it really you know if you talk to listen to Rex talk about family right and you can see his family here today so I mean this is going to be something that outlives me um, in this police department and a considerable amount of our officers so we are very glad to have this in the police department absolutely uh rex thank you so very much thank you for the the donation uh the the piece of art will be will it be in the police department itself or yes in the um, rex wanted it in the police department so it's in the police department and um it's going to stay there so very good <laughs> good you got to have key access to see it so or yes. get to it yeah would you like to come up and 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 say something to us this evening, please. Mr. Mayor, City Manager, the Council, and the Chief Hodges, many of you can tell that I am a black man. Now, nothing wrong with that. When the city hired a black man for police chief, it carries a very important message to me. You can guess the message. My family, my wife Julie is here, 
My older son is here. My granddaughter of six is here. I have children who are now in their 40s and 50s who grew up in this town, who went to school at Jefferson and Kennedy and Oak Grove. And my daughter ended up as vice principal at Kennedy. She is now school superintendent for Hopkins. We have been as a part of Bloomington for more since 1976. And we built our gallery at 90th and Penn. And I see police cars going back and forth. If you remove the police from the city, we have a word for that. We call it mayhem. I would love to do 90 miles an hour on the freeway. I don't because there are police officers on the road. So our safety as a business, and we own a home in Bloomington, how would we be safe without police officers? So this is our way of saying good job. We appreciate you. My wife told me not to talk for more than two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I quit to the officers. Rex, thank you so very much for your kind words and for your appreciation of the Bloomington Police Department. I greatly, I couldn't agree more and greatly appreciate it. What I want to make sure is you don't sell yourself short because great cities have great art. It's as simple as that. And the great art that you're providing here today, the great art that you create and that we know are in living rooms and offices and get collections across the cities, across the Twin Cities, make this world a better place. A great city has great art, and I want to thank you for your contribution to that. So very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was a wonderful ceremony. Uh, again, welcome to our new officers. Thank you to our, our, uh, our existing officers and our existing force. Welcome to our new staff. Glad to have you all on board. Now go enjoy the reception, and we'll continue the, uh, the meeting here. They never want to stick around after the, the, the swearing in. Or save us cake for that. Or, sa or save us cake. We'll give them just a minute, and then we'll move on with our agenda. That will bring us to item 2.2 on our agenda. And while we're on the topic of what makes a city great, it is great service organizations as well. And the Bloomington Lions absolutely fall under that category. And Allison, you're here to talk about a gift that the Bloomington Lions have made to the Bloomington Park and Rec Department. Allison. I am mayor, council members, city manager. Chief Hodges did not give me a script, but I will do my best without it. 
Tonight, uh, we are here to acknowledge the Bloomington Lions for their very generous donation of $20, $25,000 towards pickleball and tennis shade structures. I'm sure you guys as council members have heard maybe some of the need for some of our shade for our avid players, and we are very happy that the Bloomington Lions can help us contribute to that great need of our community. So I'd like to invite them up here to say a few words if they'd like. You guys can all come. Don't be shy. You can all come. And I've never seen a, the, the Lions Club be short of a spokesperson either, so that's good. That's well, one, one thing, um, I'm Dan Reiner. I'm the press president of, of the Bloomington Lions, and this is one of the, the projects that we, we wanted to follow through with this last year. We, we work with the International uh, Lions F Foundation. They have a strong community grant program that we support, but we occasionally can, can tap into it. Our, our commitment to one of our, quote, pillars is, is the environment. And over the last 50 plus years, the Bloomington Lions have been here. We always look for things that we can do to make a difference. And so I, I found out, well, in 2016, we, we planted tr trees in one of your parks. And this is one of the more exciting things that we, we can do is find another opportunity to, to, to give back. And so tonight, we're very proud to, to give you guys 25000 to to support the, quote, Pavilion this next year, and hopefully we, we could be there as well to celebrate its use. So on behalf of all of us, the Bloomington Lions, thank, thank you for acknowledging it tonight. Appreciate it. So here's this check, and I don't know who we pass it on to. But, <laughs> I'll come down and get it. Thank you for allowing us again to be here. Appreciate it. Thanks so very much. I think we also, I'm really excited. I talked to Allison about some community projects. We really try each month to come up with a quote community project. And so we're going to learn more about what Allison does through the parks. And hopefully we can also get back and support keeping the parks clean or whatever the things we can do. So that'll be something you'll be seeing us do more of this next year. And maybe we can even find a few more Bloomington Lion members. Amen. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thanks so very much. Mayor, council members, I just want to follow up on. Um, Dan Stamen here. You will be hearing more about our Adopt-A-Park program coming up here in October at one of your future meetings, and the Bloomington Lions are really excited to be a part of that program. So look forward to hearing from about that in the future. Actually, I heard from them Saturday morning at the farmer's market I stopped by and, and heard quite a bit about that and was happy to hear the uh, have the conversation and hear about the plans for the future. So thank you. Thanks thank for you. all that you do for the city of Bloomington and the community around us. Thank you. Item 2.3 on our agenda is uh, a second introduction of new employees. We uh, met our new members of the police department earlier. Now we're going to talk to and meet uh, some new members of our community development department. So good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. I have four new dynamic employees that are joined the community development department. So I'm going to start with Matt Ammerman, who started with the city on May 1st. He is a commercial property appraiser. Prior to joining the team, he was a commercial appraiser at Dakota County for six years. Before working for Dakota County, he was a commercial free fee appraiser in Chicago for over 15 years. Here at the city of Bloomington, he works primarily on hotel and office properties. And he is married to Becky, and they live in St. Paul with their daughter, Asia, and too many pets. In his free time, he enjoys hiking, camping and following Premier League soccer. Thank you, Matt. Next, I have Courtney Briggs, who started in Environmental Health Division on August 7th as an office support specialist. She's worked the last two years at Woodlake Medical Management in Minnetonka. However, she's excited to get back into local government based on her nine years at the city of Edina in the Parks and Recreation Department. 
This includes positions at the Aquatic Center on-site facility manager, Edinburgh Park Guest Services, and Centennial Lakes Park Supervisor. In her free time, Courtney likes to play video games and board games, travel, and go to weekly trivia with her friends, and her trivia team took second place last week. Mm, well done. <laughs> My good friends at Parks, hands off, Courtney, please. <laughs> <laughs> and next we have Marit Rasmussen, who joined the Port Authority in May as an office support specialist. She was born and raised in the Twin Cities, where she spent 17 years working with Northwest Airlines in various roles. Most recently, she spent seven years in the residential home construction industry working as a closing coordinator and assisting with permitting in Austin, Texas. But she came back to Minnesota to be closer to her family. She recently became a Bloomington resident and moved into an apartment in early August. And she loves her new home and spends her free time walking around Highland Lake. So welcome, Mart. And last but certainly not least, and you're going to hear from him later on this evening as well, we have Kenny Niemeyer, who started in August as a housing development specialist for the Port Authority. And this is part of our expansion of the Port and the work they're doing citywide. And we really felt we needed somebody to, to champion our Opportunity Housing Ordinance, and this will be Kenny. Prior to coming to Bloomington, he worked at the City of Plymouth for the past year administering their rehab and first-time home buyer loans, as well as the city's community development block grant programs. He has a master's in urban and regional planning with a concentration on housing and community development. And his career passion centers on equitable, expanding access to housing in the Twin Cities. Kenny was born and raised in Minnesota. In his free time, he sings tenor with one of the voice mix chorus and plays softball on the Twin Cities Good Time Softball League. Their team name is the pitch hitters. <laughs> so, here they are. Well, thank you. Uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you so very much for, for choosing Bloomington as the place that you want to further your career. We, we, we welcome you. We're greatly appreciative that you're here. Um, you've, got, uh, you've got big jobs ahead of you, and I will say it's interesting as we've started talking internally about looking more about uh, the port work across the city, and concentrating more on housing, I've been hearing a lot from residents who are echoing that and who are saying how important that is and how much they support the work that we're doing in that regard. So um, no pressure or anything, but it's, uh, <laughs> you've got folks who are, who are interested in the work that you're doing and are excited to see the work that's going to get done. So welcome aboard. Thank you for being here. Carla, thank you for the introductions this evening. Thanks for, thank you all for being here and, and welcome. Glad to have you on board. Item 2.4 on our agenda is an update from our Hennepin County Commissioner, Commissioner Debbie Gattel. Commissioner, I'm sorry, you're kind of in a tough spot here. Boy, you're following up the police swearing in and the lions and the new employees. All the good stuff. You know, I remember this when I was in the council. I, this is the best part of your job, isn't it, to see all it these is. wonderful people and to bring great people on board? Yes, this is, this is so much fun. So. Well, welcome. Thank you for being with us tonight. Yes, thank you, Mayor Bessie, council members, and city staff. I just want to say it's really honored to be here again this year and now that we're out of a pandemic to be able to present in front of you this way. And it's... Uh, it's really nice, and I do have some slides to share, so um, are they up showing? They're coming up right now, okay. That's wonderful, thank you. There we, there we go, I can see, the, I can see myself on camera. <laughs> That's better than I used to be able to do, right? All this technology. So next slide, please. So just to introduce myself for the, uh, those folks who might be watching the reruns or are on tonight, um, my district is the great city of Bloomington where we're here tonight. Um, most of Eden Prairie, just south of uh, Crosstown area for the most part, um, Richfield. And then I have three precincts, uh, two precincts, excuse me, in the city of Minneapolis after redistricting. So that's, I had an expansion of some of my uh, area, which is absolutely nice too. You know, um, one of the things I always have to talk to people is when they say, when I tell them I'm a Hennepin County Commissioner, you know, one of the first things that they ask me is, well, what does a Hennepin County Commissioner do? Right? They have no idea. We fly under the radar quite a bit. It's not like the job when I was mayor. Everybody was, there were people who showed up at my doorstep. I'm sure you're used to this mayor. You know, and everybody knows you. They know you in the, they know you in the supermarket. Well, I'm still known in Richfield that way, and some, for some folks in Bloomington, it's, uh, it's a lot different. 
And uh, although I get consti- I don't get the constituent calls I used to, I, the ones I get are, are extremely difficult to solve. And so those are the kinds of things that are similar, and I tell them it's like being a mayor on steroids. So, <laughs> so um, at least I've had that experience to know that. So um, government is really different when, when you're governing in the county level. So that's one of the things. The next slide then. Um, this is the Hennepin County budget, and uh, you, a lot of you know, I think I've shared with a lot of you here that we are setting our levy at 6.5%. Uh, um, we um, steward roughly $2.7 billion uh, annual budget across a range of topics. The topics encompass uh, human services, public health, public safety, public works, residential services, which includes libraries, elections, disparity reduction is driving principles that embedded all workers we can do. Um, through our HRA, we steward considerable investments into housing, economic development. We do this on behalf of 1.26 million uh, deserving residents. Um, that's one in five we who call um, Hennepin County home. So a lot of folks here that count on us. Our budget last week was approved 991.3 million maximum property level for uh, for 2024 and an increase of the 6.5 I mentioned earlier, an amount of 60.5 million. Um, Administrator Huff presented a $2.64 billion proposed budget for the board, which will be examined and modified throughout several months, just much like what you do. You start with a proposed levy. Sometimes it can go down, but it cannot go back up. Um, we prioritize deeply investing into affordable housing in Hennepin County and our workforce. We're also maintaining innovative programs born out of the pandemic response and recovery. So a great deal of that budget increase is going to pay wages for our workers, um, which I think you probably experienced. Healthcare, healthcare has rise, been rising quite a bit. We also are going to be hiring some full-time equivalents into the social service sectors right now. So those are some of the priorities that we will have on, on, on this. Um, the budget hearing will take Take place uh, in December when we conclude our budget is on the fiscal year where yours might um, uh, from January to January where a lot of people do it the other way through July to follow the state legislature we do not um, so I've also brought a handout with me this is the proposed tax levy and how it's going to impact um, different cities throughout the metropolitan area I thought it would be interesting for you to see I know you do this for your own tax levy because I've been here when you present it so I'll pass this to Lona first oh to Mike There's 10 copies of that, so you can have that to look at yourself. I find that a really good little primer, and I keep those, so I always circle my cities, and I know what's going on in my cities all the time that, that I represent. So um, the uh, so um, next slide. So the pandemic response. So we're allocating 400, and we allocated 246 million in federal recovery funds throughout the pandemic um, to several different smart and innovative programmings aimed to help residents emerge stronger and more resilient. As of quarter two of 2023, we have spent more than 111 million of those funds, with the remainder allocated and ready to be out the door before 2024. We will spend it down. Um, so you can see there's large investments in those areas which include up their employment strategies you know the recovery behavioral health the employ you know um the um Violence prevention, that's a big one across our, our towns that we're looking at. Housing and homeless, a lot of dollars went into those kinds of things. We help people pay their mortgages. We help them pay their utilities. We help get food on their tables, and we pay their back rent. And we are still doing some of that right now. So just so you know, we've actually um, been able to go and get more federal dollars for those people who did not, those states that did not spend their dollars. They have to turn them back in, and some have already. And we actually, they go back out for bid for RFPs, and we've been able to bring in more dollars and put more dollars toward emergency housing on that, which is much needed right now. So next slide. This is one of the topics that comes up a lot, which is public safety and mental health. And I know this is near and dear to your hearts, too, with all the hard work that you already do. One, you know, a lot of instance, we saw a lot of 
people come out of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic with mental health crises or mental health issues, especially our students and our schools, but also even our adults. And, and um, there were a lot of people who just did not come out of that hole. Hennepin County is working in many fronts to mitigate some of this, to build out our mental health support systems across an entire continuing of work, public safety and justice outcomes for this process so that it's more fair and equitable to those who run into the public safety issues. You know, there's crucial space where the issues intersect both the police and the social worker programs. You know, starting in 2019, this has become an essential new response, which is the embedded social workers, which you you were one of the first pilots here, as was Richfield. So thank you for that. Um, and you continue to expand as I talk to your police and your fire department checking in on a regular basis. Thank you for all the hard work. Um, you know, the municipalities, there's 45 social workers now out there. Um, in 2022 alone, Bloomington received 1,109 mental health calls, 584 of which were referred to the PESW program. Through quarter two of 2023, we have seen 465 referrals with 158 clients referred to a range of social services, including mental health, drug treatment, housing, and employment services. And Hennepin County has also been helping your schools to get uh, mental health care providers. That That's had some mixed results, I will say, not because we're not providing it, because we can't keep mental health care workers. We're in the same streets as everybody else is across the nation of trying to get those great folks to more of them into slots that can help our students and help our communities. So just a heads up, we'll continue to work on that. Um, slide seven, please. Um, so one of the big campaigns is on um, seeing mental health. It's, it's a countywide campaign, and it's one of many responses to the negative impact of COVID-19 pandemic. The campaign's intended to emphasize the importance of the conversation and the connection to ways we can reduce the stigma and the isolation. The campaign targets youth veterans, seniors, and diverse communities. We know our immigrant families really struggle with some of this. Um, we see mental health campaign that's been possible through the federal pandemic recovery dollars. As of quarter two of 2023, the campaign has received 70 million impressions, 34% of di uh, digital impressions reaching youth, and 16.3 million total impressions from communities of color. This is the target audience that we really need to hit, and we are glad that we are getting there. We still have more outreach to do in these communities, though. So. Next slide. So, um, and this is about the school-based mental health program. According to the CDC, more than four in 10 students feel persistently sad or hopeless. One in three experience poor mental health. This painful trend has only gotten worse and the result of the pandemic. Through our school mental health partnership, we are now providing services to more than 7,000 students. And as of 2023, this program is in every district and every school countywide. So that's something we can all be proud of, you know, and if we can just keep those services coming and those providers around. Next slide. Um, we, we all know all economic recovery followed the end of COVID-19. Public health emergency means continuing support for small businesses, the backbone of our local economy. During the pandemic, the Small Business Relief Fund administered by Hennepin County provided over $70 million in recovery grants to small businesses with 335 grants totaling $3.9 million into Bloomington alone. So this is one of your... Great little side businesses. Next slide. But we know our responsibility doesn't end there. That's why we continue to leverage Elevate Hennepin, a resource hub connecting local entrepreneurs to expert advisors at no cost on a wide range of topics listed here. Folks can visit elevatehennepin.org anytime. Um, there's been a lot of conversation, and you have been an early adopter of there, especially with your innovation and the space you're opening up to businesses here in the future. I was able to go over there and see some of the production, and you guys are are really going to hit the floor running here with all the innovation lab that you're going to be setting up for businesses and I've heard from them they're really thrilled to be a part of this so thank you very much um, next slide um, 
This is just one piece of a broader strategy. We're, go we're going to support entrepreneurs and businesses at every stage, including through the range of additional programs. To s you can see here, thousands of businesses have used Elevate, and so we decided we needed to do more, including more than 1,600 who have accessed over 13 thousand hours of free one-on-one -on -one advising on cohort learning opportunities. So whether you have a new idea or you're looking to scale, we're here to meet you and we're going to help you thrive. Again, good government action. And you know what? We keep hearing back from the people who've been through some of these programming and worked with us. And this is why we keep bringing more things on board because they say, we need this piece. We need that piece. So we bring those consultants in for free so people can utilize them for their businesses. And so it's really great to get that feedback loop going. I'm looking for Bloomington to be one of those great feedback loops too here as you open things up. So thank you very much. Next slide. So, and when it comes to local businesses, I know I'm not the only one here who loves to see more diverse tax base um, and, and welcome this well-paying jobs and responsible corporate companies. Um, county contributed 300000 through our transit-oriented development program to help close a financial gap to, to establish SIC North America headquarters here in South Loop. And with the new CHIPS Act, dollars like this, you know, are, are for polar semiconductors are going to continue. You know, this advocacy and this investment that the mayor and the council and the port authority supported to our free trade zone, this is this is a fabulous beginning for them. I know that Bloomington is only just one of the on the verge of a huge boom, an economic boom in the years to come. You certainly are an economic engine here in the metro area. Next slide. So you know, now something completely different. We're going to talk about trees. <laughs> so, something. Uh, you know, very broadly, our goal is to plant a million trees in 2030 in the collaboration. This is part of our climate action plan and some of the work that we're doing in a broad base and, uh, you know, carbon sequestration. So uh, we estimate that 348,000 trees will have been planted in 2020 by the year's end. The goal is to mitigate the loss of tree canop uh, canopy, and that's from the emerald ash borer that we're seeing and other pests that we've seen, the oak wilt, all these other things that are killing some of our species. So there's a special focus on improving equity in this tree canopy, reducing air pollution, and combating the urban heat island effect. So those are some of the things that we, we um, are definitely focused on. So when you look at your plans, those are where we're trying to get our dollars to invest too. So some of the really great things um, I want to highlight in this program is $500,000, which is made available through our Healthy Tree Canopy Grant Program, annually goes to city schools, affordable housing providers, and nonprofits, so it's a cost-sharing program that you get a tree and we pay half those costs. Many of the trees Hennepin County grows itself. So, um, wholesale trees purchasing opportunities for the county. Um, our forestry pathways program is helping bring young uh, adults and to a career path too. If you're looking to get a forester into your uh, future in the city, and the county's first ever urban tree carbon offset sales program is starting. So I think that's kind of a fun thing to be thinking about too as you look at your own climate action plan and I know you're well on your way in your areas there too for that. Um, slide 14 please. So we're going to talk about Bloomington transportation projects. And the lastly, in partnership with the Public Works Department, we want to include this map and list some of the future infrastructure projects on the horizon. I'm not going to go through all these line by line, but you want to, might want to personally extend a big thanks and collaboration to um, all the folks who made all these pro great projects, you know, possible. Nicollet Avenue is going to be a big one. The I-494 corridor is something I've worked closely with your staff here in Bloomington. Thank you very much. They are great to work with. East Bush Lake Road was a great repaving project. Um, much needed. Uh, I just want to say that these are these have been on the back burner for a very long time, and these roads are in dire straits to needing some of the best help that we can give them. And I know there were a couple of other questions. Um, so with that, uh, Mayor Bussey, I'll turn things back over, and I'm happy to stand for comments and questions. I had one on sustainability already and another on the homeless. So if I may. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, Council, I know, yes, I, I heard a couple of questions that were percolating this afternoon as well. So yes, if you wanted to 
address the, the two questions that came your way earlier today. So the sustainability question was around the organics recycling. Mm -hmm. So we are mandated to pass that down as, as the county that has to register that. So you are mandated as a city now to offer organics recycling um, to residents. Now, it's a slow go and it's a slog. I, I know there aren't as many adopters as we would like. This is true. We have goals set, too. We're out at all the fairs. We were out at the buzz fair. I met the mayor out there. We were out there talking, too, and we signed up like 25 folks for the organics recycling after we talked to them there. So there'll be more people, and I know that there are also community sites to drop off where people could do it there because a lot of people don't have enough organics to, to have a big bin or don't want to do that. So when some people actually compost in their own yard like myself I've been doing it for decades and so I drop the few bones and things I have off at my community site as well the reason we all have to pay for this is because we all use the roads we all do all the infrastructure and we're all going to pay for those community sites and everybody else and we really want everybody to be on board with this and I know it'll take time I know we're going to be working going through the schools to teach our kids some of this you know if we work with the kids lots of times they bring it home it's kind of like the seat belt things we did it's also like we did with just picking up trash around parks and around roads and everything give a hoot don't pollute those were the days that I had you know we all did this as kids it'll take time it's going to take a lot of time to bring this forward but we will and we're going to be doing more. There's also grant dollars. There's environmental grant dollars. So if you have a great idea for how to get more organics recycling or get the word out more, the education piece, please put in for a Hennepin County grant. We would love for you to get one of those grants. I would certainly follow it for you so that we can get more done faster and quicker. And this would be great. So one of the other questions was is about the homeless issues and some of them. Let me tell you, on a, on a regular year, Hennepin County spends $140 million on housing and housing supports. So that's just to stand up housing so that we can put people in it, right? And those supports are the social workers and other people or, day, or care workers that have to be around those folks because some of them can't live totally independent in that, those housing and they, because of the issues that they face. But there, are, there is a, a big issue that happened after the pandemic. We, we dropped the moratorium so people were now could evict folks. And we did expect the uptick, and we did see it, but we did expect that we would see the curve start to go down. We have not seen it. We expected it by now. And this is extremely disappointing and alarming. And so this is one of the reasons why we have more, more homeless and more evictions than we can put our hands together to, to grab. We are grabbing people at the courts. We literally of Hennepin County hired attorneys at the courts to try to negotiate out of the evictions and other things there to try to stem it at the court area side. We're still trying to figure out how to get even further upstream to get to people that we can get them the emergency dollars and assistance with some of those federal grants that we're getting to give them emergency dollars. The average person is now behind four to six months of rent not a couple, so it's not a small ticket item to pay that back, rent for them to get them whole and on their feet, and sometimes it's not feasible or the right direction for them, but we'd like to keep the eviction off of their record. And I know that there is a hotel here, the Holiday Inn, and I want to thank the city manager and the city council for helping Hennepin County with this and taking on this um, big lift. Um, we all have homeless, and you are doing your part. Thank you. These are families. These are usually moms with kids that are there. They are fully taken care of and supported by Hennepin County. There's 24-7 around the clock services, food, care, and security for them. So I know that I had heard from Veep that there is a huge uptick in Venezuelans um, asking for food. It is not from that shelter. It is because your families, your generous families here, have already settled to ask for their relatives, and they are bringing them here. And so that is the uptick that you are seeing, is actually the amount of families that actually have sponsored their families to come in here, and they are coming from the border into here, and they're bused into Hennepin County. We know this because we greet the buses. So... I did want to let you know about some of the concerns. And I have gotten concerns from uh, some of your constituents, and I think uh, I've shared them always with your city manager so he knew that I was also responding to them. Uh, and I've shared those responses with them that, you know, we are very grateful and it's very generous, and we thought we would be out of that hotel. 
We are not. And it continues to go. As soon as we house people, we house people out of there monthly. And they fill up. We are at 300% capacity. That hotel is full and we are looking for more. We can't find any now at this point. We have purchased a couple of motels and we do single room occupancies, but that's for homeless people who will now live in those. Those are usually single people. And we put social services around those and those are all in Minneapolis currently. And we just bought a third one, I believe. And so we renovate them and we put social services around them. So we don't know where we're going to find more capacity here if we can't stem the tide of this issue. Thus, that's the why you see the 6.5% increase in the new hires. They will be in the social services to cover those. We don't have enough people to respond to the overwhelming need that we are still seeing that um, after the pandemic that was somewhat unexpected. People, not everybody are on their, is on their feet. They're just not all doing so well. So if there's other questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, Commissioner. Council, any additional questions or other questions? Council Member Lohman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And uh, just since I have this opportunity, I want to say thank you for your years of service uh, to so many residents across the, the district. And we know that we appreciate uh, your, your, your hard work uh, that you've done on behalf of our city and for many other cities. Um, I know you you know, also have the same passion that uh, uh, Council Member D'Alessandra and I share around uh, sustainability. And I wonder if, um, you know, we, we both serve on uh, transportation uh, uh, 35W solutions. And I wonder, I know that's one of the largest contributors to, um, you know, the greenhouse uh, effects. And, I, and I'm, always, I'm just curious to see, you know, what can we do? I know there's so little that we can do at the city level, but, you know, at the county level, it's a little bit higher and we can do. So if you, if you could at all just any recommendations you might make that, that we at the city level or at the county level uh, could, could make an addition. I know uh, we have the, um, the overall goal of trying to get um, uh, to net zero um, uh, by uh, 2050 um, in the plan, and we've got a, a similar plan, too, here in Bloomington. So I'd be curious about that. And then I also have a question around uh, if anything more can be done uh, with the Burnsville landfill uh, with uh, anything with that in terms of the just there's the, uh, the ongoing effects of you know the water uh, mitigation and I know they're in a tight spot down there and I know it's not in our, our county but I uh, would be curious about anything you have to say about that. Well, those are really great questions. And first of all, let me start with, you know, the zero emissions and the 494 core and all those. Um, yes, Carl Keel and I, um, thank you, Carl. Carl's just a, a, a great asset here at the city. I just want to say that. Um, sit on the 494 corridor when we were working on that, the beginning of that. And I'll be at the open house that they have coming up soon. We also um, sit on, he's on the TAC and I'm on the TAB. It's part of the same organization. And we all we are looking at the county level, the metro level, and the state. We are partnering together about vehicle miles traveled and how do we get people out of the vehicles and into a public transportation. With the corridor opening up, it'll make the transit system move faster there. With even that underpass on the Richfield side, because you have the American Boulevard side, we can do ring road kinds of features too at uh, certain times of the day to get the transit. So that's one big piece of it is trying to get people more into transit and we are seeing ridership go up it's not quite pre-pandemic levels but it's close and in some places it is pre-pandemic levels so that's an encouraging sign we're also working at a major um, program and we have dollars for this as well as metro and as the state for electrification so that we will electrify corridors so that people who go ahead and purchase those electric vehicles will have a viable opportunity to get them um, charged when wherever they're going, wherever they're stopping, so that there's multiple sites and everything. So that's being planned in a coordinated way, which is great. We're also talking to companies and because some of the companies are putting them in themselves at different places, and we want them to be a part of the solution too. We're looking at you know, standardizing as well. And it looks like we're going to the Tesla model for standardization in this industry, which makes a sense to get down to one rather than two. Um, and then to have various type of charging, some of them fast charges, some of them not so fast charges and having the pricing, you know, through the demand on those. So those are some of the things that we can do to encourage some of that great behavior besides just making our streets safer. Uh, making them flow better, you know, so people who want to bike or want to walk feel safer, 
you know, it, you know, and back in the day, and, and Bloomington did this just as the city of Ridgefield did this, as we took our roads, we wanted, we just widen them, and the sidewalks are right up against the streets in some of these places, and those don't feel safe. There's no way those feel safe. And as we're road dieting down and putting up better sidewalks and everything, you're seeing a lot more people out. You're seeing a lot more kids out. They're, they're biking to school and those, those kinds. Now we got to make those roads safer. And we also have to get people more used to stopping for pedestrians. That's one of the things I have in some of the crossing 66th Street. People aren't used to people crossing 66th Street. And they're not used to seeing a pedestrian crossing and, pe and stopping for it. So these are some of the things that it's going to take a long time, and we're trying to figure out what kind of traffic features work, the traffic calming, those kinds of things, to make it safer to, for people. We're also coordinating, believe it or not, with the cities, the city plows and the county plows and the metro plows to not plow in the buses, the bus shelters, so that the bus shelters can stay open and so they're not iced over and everything like this so people don't fall and hurt themselves. A lot of people don't want to fall on the ice, so we got to keep the, the routes to the, the bus shelters open and safe. And so that's one of the coordinated efforts that I um, had started last year as uh, Public Works is talking to your Public Works, is talking to the Metro Public Works as we start going down through the road. So there's a lot of little things that are going on to make it safer and make it a more viable option for people to take transit and do other things. We are expanding the transit. We keep putting on another BRT line about every other year. So, and that's going to keep up. We're not, we're not stopping there. So, and I know I, I followed American Boulevard. I know you didn't get yours yet. I know it's, it's way in the future, but as your density grows there, and it will, it's going to happen. So I can see that because you definitely need something east-west. That would be a great bus route. I was, I was for keeping it on the map. I voice that opinion. Other questions? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for being here. Really appreciate you. Um, I think the update uh, that you gave to us on the folks that are experiencing homelessness was really important to the community. I know we've gotten a lot of questions about um, uh, folks out, uh, you know, asking for money and things like that, and, and so it's really noticeable in the yes. community that there is uh, an uptick in in uh, folks that are are needing help. Um, I'm curious if, if, if there's been any conversation between the county and the state about um, more permanent solutions to folks who are experiencing um, uh, homelessness due to uh, mental health issues. Um, I know that, um, you know, we didn't do it right many years ago, but we did have uh, you know, the opportunity for folks to, um, who, who could not find a way to be, you know, incorporated into society to find a safe and comfortable place to be housed and served. And those programs on a long-term basis seem to have been cut down pretty dramatically over the course of the last 40 to 50 years. Um, I, 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 the conversations I have with police officers is very much around the kind of revolving door associated with this, right? And it does feel to me like that's beyond a local level issue to address. And I imagine even it's beyond the county level necessarily to address. And so I'm curious if there's any conversations um, with the Department of Human Services or Health and Human Services and, and the county around what the state is willing to bring forward to help put a long-term you know, support services in place for Hennepin County residents? Well, there is a couple of things going on. I will tell you that 1800 Chicago, and it's something we really need to work with the public safety departments more around our cities, is 24-7 open now. So as those kinds of folks are in your community and need those, those services right now, the officers can take them right down to 1800 Chicago if they're having a mental health crisis. So it's not just your embedded social worker. That, that has that on their plate. So that's that's an opportunity. The other thing is, is that the HCMC hospital is looking at a much larger mental health ward to be able to house those people. Um, and so we would like to, to grow that, and we have all, we've been talking about that as a much larger, and we would be going to the state to ask for dollars to support that so that we could treat more people long-term in a mm -hmm. facility, you know, that was more appropriate. Um, there are other appropriate places for them to go, but it takes a lot of wraparound services to put them in, 
And because of some of the laws that had changed a long time ago, they are no longer allowed to just be putting them in necessarily group homes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they have the right to live out on their own, but to try to get those socialists is extremely expensive and we don't have the personnel to do it. This is a nationwide issue Mm -hmm. to be able to house these people very differently. But we're hopeful that some of those things, there are some real bottlenecks because we have some extremely uh, agitated people who were, uh, there was one man who has literally been in our ward and shut down a whole wing of one of our mental health wards, and we've not been able to move him back to St. Peter where he belonged. They moved him out of there, and he ended up right back in, and he should have never been out, and we can't get St. Peter to take them. And so we've been going to the governor's office. This is some of the things that we're dealing with, some of these extreme cases where people cannot be on their own, and they need they need to be in a facility. Mm-hmm. And yes, we changed the laws a long time ago, and people have the right to choose now rather than us pushing them into that. And quite frankly, what's so sad, because I'm out on the streets to talk to some of these folks, is that they turn us down. We offer and offer and offer, and they turn us down. You know, we offer them to take them someplace. Um, But if we see a family up on a corner, I mean, I stop no matter where I'm at, what time of day, and I call. Usually your public safety or whoever's, I think it was Eden Prairie's last time I saw a family out, and I told them where it is, and I asked them to come pick them up and take them to Hennepin County Shelters because we'll house a family in 24 hours, 24 hours time frame into a hotel room somewhere. We will not allow a family with children out on the streets. So that is one thing that we have. So, And I'm sure your officers all know about these programs and how to get in touch with us through the, through the off hours too. So some of those things we are able to do. Um, we don't have enough mental health treatment, and not everybody will seek it if we get it to them. We don't have enough addiction treatment, and even if we offer it, they don't. We um, tripled our low barrier, which means people who have ser- who are still using can use that, and it's still it's at capacity, and there are waiting lists, and there's not enough room for them. We just don't have a way to keep ahead of this yet, and it's the same thing with the families that we're housing you know, throughout the city, but also here in Bloomington. Thank you. Appreciate the information there. The second question I have for you is uh, related to uh, transit. So for a number of years, we've talked internally within the city about um, uh, improved public transit services here. I know you and I spoke at one point about um, potentially, you know, considering the piloting of of the uh, mobile app service that Metro Transit has. But it seems like Metro Transit if I can be blunt, doesn't kind of have its act together at the moment. Um, And so I'm curious as to whether or not you've heard any more uh, from them uh, and and Met Council about expanding any services uh, to the, to, to, um, well, specifically Bloomington, but in general around some innovations um, that would maybe help with us uh, to have more public intra-city. We we obviously can get to and from Minneapolis pretty well, right? We have uh, the blue line, we have the orange line, et cetera. Um, But there are, there's certainly limits within the city that, you you know, we could support a number of ways. And I'm curious if that conversation has come up at all. And if so, great. If not, maybe we could have that conversation. I just don't know where Metro Transit is with its, you know, new programming at the moment. Well, there's two parts, and they have, they have, and they've actually done pilots, but they're up in northeast Minneapolis. And so they have done circulator type type programs was already and tried them and they were accepted and they were and some of them are dial and some of them have been just regular pickups and going to regular places within that most people need to go to so they have tried some of these as pilots unfortunately we are the land of 10,000 pilots sometimes and we're never able to scale because of the cost of those kinds of scaling now i know some cities have been successful i know eden prairie has a a trans a small inner city transit that goes around and it's an inner city uh, loop that they do and even some kids can take it off to school and everything like this when they have an irregular school time and everything like this and i know um, other folks use it to get around to doctor's appointments and groceries and other things and i hear that it works quite well um, years ago, Richfield had a senior bus that took people around to the senior luncheons and several other things and would do up to the door stops and everything like this, but it all came down to funding. Now, it's you know, Eden Prairie's had to fund that themselves 
you know, through through their own tax dollars because there are not Met Council dollars to do those kinds of things intra-city, which would be really delightful and really helpful to residents just about in any city. I think we hear that. As we have an aging population, if we want to get VMTs down, if we want to get to zero carbon, we need to have those kinds of operations, and they do need to be door-to-door -door service for some folks because in the middle of the winter, you're not going to have an 80-year-old going to want to go walk down to that bus stop through all that snow and ice they're not going to do it right they can't take the risk they can't take the risk to fall they need door-to-door -door service and so those are the kinds of things that um i think they've looked at it they think that they know there's a need they know that they can make it work but um whether there's a will at the state to start funding some of those things um and the met council we shall see you know because those are things that you as a city could push yourself rather than doing it some cities decided not to wait and have done it on their own. Yeah. Uh, thank you. The final thing I just want to say, and I'm very excited about your tree program. Um, I know that we have, uh, including coming up here, uh, are looking at, at grants for the DNR, but some of our local populations, our nonprofits are are coming to you all with grants. And so um, I'm looking forward just in general to the combination of our parks department, our nonprofit community organizing and other things working together to get as much of that money as we can, uh, you know, funneled into solving our, our, our tree problem. Um, so I just want to say thank you for that. Make, thank you for making that available. And um, one way or the other, I think that Bloomingtonians are going to utilize that because we do love our trees. Um, thanks for being here. I want to do go back to your Burnsville landfill. I, I commented on that several times in a letter to MPCA against that for so many environmental reasons and why they allowed that i don't know being the mpca and epa even allowed it region five it's beyond me i think you know beyond i think the only thing the biggest impact we could we could have was to um not fight anybody as one of the environmental organizations wants to sue burnsville which they could and i suspect it may happen for the expansion of that because when the gravel pit stops the operations there and they say that they will in the next 10 years they will no longer be able to pump water and if they don't pump water that water will fill into that landfill and that is not a good thing if we ever look to needing that water as a drinking water source that is a very bad thing there is no reason and it's a really bad reason to ever put a landfill down on a river bottom and it's like building on a river bottom, not a good idea either. They flood, and they do a lot of damage. And we know that there's more and more floods. And when the waters come, like these last few days, you know, it's been over three inches of rain, we've seen. That's a lot of rain for us to absorb in a short period of time after a drought. And it will impact things. So I'm very concerned about that as well. I, I don't have another route to go. And, in fact, when I talked to the newer... Uh, MPCA commissioner, she said she would have never let that pass. And that's really sad. And now because of that, the freeway Ford site wants to expand theirs. And that's a super fun site, right? So that's even worse. I'm full of good news. You guys are just asking the <laughs> tough questions. There's a lot of good going on in Hennepin County, but, you know, it always seems like, you know, those are the tough questions and those are the things we wrestle with, right? You do as a council and I do too as a mm. board member. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. I just want to acknowledge and thank Commissioner Gotell. We have a, a regular meeting with our uh, regional partners at the county and the Metropolitan Council and the Metropolitan Airports Commission just to make sure that all of us agencies are coordinating and working together on issues of common interest to our constituents. And I appreciate that Commissioner Gotell has always prioritized that meeting and, and makes a habit of being there and uh, being an active contributor and making sure that we have the information that we need to serve our residents, and she's eager to know what it is that we're doing so she can better do her job. So thank you, Commissioner. Yes. I did want to depart one last thing, because it, even um, um, Council Member D'Alessandro talked about it was the HERC. Many of you know that um, you know there's been some legislation going on at the state level about uh, pro producing a report which we have produced to uh, of a sh possible shutdown for the HERC at some point. We have to get to zero waste before we can shut down the HERC because there's no place. Your waste goes to HERC. And there are people who would like to have it closed tomorrow. And if you don't stand up for your city, knowing that there is, you would be putting it into landfills, 
and I don't know what landfills would accept all this waste as it would close because everybody would be fighting over what space is available. And I'm sure you don't want to add to Burnsville's after the battle you've had, whether they'd even take it, right? So those are some of the issues that you face right now. You can also help, as you'll see, we'll have a very strong platform for a lot of really bold and innovative things that the state needs to do for us to get to that zero waste if they want us to shut down that herc sooner. Because if they don't do them, that's not a possibility. Because we will be out of the waste business and every city will be on their own to take their waste and do with it what they can. And that would be really a shame. We don't want to do that. That is not the service model that we have as a county for you. But that is where we are left. Now we are building a biodigester. So we will take those organics and whatever we can burn and we will go um, out of that waste stream and put them in a biodigester that will also churn electricity of some sort. We haven't decided exactly how, but we've already cited it and we have money and we have plans, but it's a long way off and we have to get that thing up and running before, you know, that's one of our biggest things is to get that so we can take the organics and other things that are carbon-based to take through there. But we have to get things recycled. We have to ban plastic bags. We have to, one-use types of, of packaging has to ha have to go away. We can't be doing these kinds of things and expect to go to zero waste. Cardboard can't be, We. I was just at the Herc not long ago and saw a whole um, uh, truckload full of cardboard boxes. Those can be recycled. And they should never come to the Herc. And in fact, we penalize trucks that come in with them so that they go take them someplace else. So those are kinds of things that we are really working hard, of increasing those kinds of penalty fees when they bring a truck like that. But we could use your help in letting your representatives know that closing the Herc now is not a good idea and until we have a better solution and going to landfill is not the solution that's moving backwards that would move you backwards it would move us backwards it would move the state backwards so commissioner thank you yes <laughs> thank you for your hard work thank you for your advocacy on behalf of bloomington thanks for your your service as councilmember loman has said uh, you, you've put in a lot of years, and we appreciate the work that you do and, and all that you do for the city of Bloomington. So thanks for being with us tonight. Well, I love the city of Bloomington. You guys are great. Thanks. Thank you. Our final agenda item under our introductory items tonight is item 25, and that is a review of the 2023 National Community Survey. As I mentioned earlier, it's a an annual survey that we have been doing actually for some time now and uh, seen some interesting results. Diane Kirby, our Community Services Director, is gonna lead us through the results. Good evening, welcome. Well, good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. And, and as the Mayor mentioned, um, the, we have been doing the National Community Survey of Bloomington residents for a number of years. In fact, this is the 12th time, the 12th survey in a row that I have stood before you to provide the results of the National Community Survey of Bloomington residents. So I have uh, a lot of, lot of information to provide to you tonight. There were 150, 145 different categories that were tested this year. And I'm gonna provide just a high level overview of those results and do that hopefully fairly quickly as well. So let's go ahead and get started. And um, let's start though with a little bit of background about the National Community Survey and the vendor that uh, conducts the survey. And that is POCO NRC. So the National Research Center at POCO gives local governments and other public sector organizations the data they need to make more informed decisions. And since 1994, the NRC has been working with local governments nationwide, hundreds of jurisdictions nationwide. The NRC is best known for its national benchmarking surveys, including the National Community Survey. And in fact, NRC's benchmark database is the largest of its kind in the United States. We'll talk more about that in a minute. NRC and POCO merged back in 2019, and NRC POCO also collaborates with the International City County Managers Association. The National Community Survey, or what we call the NCS, is a standardized five-page comprehensive survey that allows municipalities and counties to assess resident opinion about their community and local government. The NCS focuses on the livability of a community, and in fact, it measures 10 main facets, which they have identified as most vital to creating a quality community that people want to live in. So this year's National Community Survey of Bloomington Residents. This survey was a random sample scientific survey that 
as I said, has been conducted annually in Bloomington since 2012. This year, there were 4,500 households that received the survey in the mail. The polling took place between April 27th and June 8th of this year. There were 709 surveys that were completed. That's a response rate of 16%. The margin of error was plus or minus 4% with a 95% confidence level. Uh, there was also an open participation opt-in survey that was conducted online that attracted 557 responses. And those results were kept separate from the random sample survey results. So for those 4,500 households, the first mailing was a postcard inviting the household to participate in the survey. And then the next mailing contained a cover letter with instructions, the survey questionnaire, and a posted paid return envelope. All mailings included a web link to give residents the option to fill it out online. And all mailings contained paragraphs in English and Spanish instructing participants on how to complete the survey in their preferred language. As I mentioned before, one of the advantages in participating in the NCS is the opportunity to compare our ratings get, uh, against communities across the nation. So there are currently about 500 communities in the NCS's database. Bloomington received comparisons to the entire benchmark database nationwide, and we also opted to receive custom benchmark comparisons from a list of peer cities that were hand-selected for having characteristics similar to Bloomington. And that list did include 14 cities in Minnesota, including Egan, Edina, Eden Prairie, uh, Richfield, Plymouth, Woodbury, and Duluth. So what we're going to do now is dive into the survey results. As I mentioned before, there were 145 categories in the standard questionnaire this year. 118 of those ratings were similar to last year, so similar to the margin of error. 18 ratings increased above the margin of error. That included crime prevention, public information services, code enforcement, availability of preventive health services, and sense of civic and community pride. And then there were nine categories that experienced significant decreases in 2023. They included residents' connection and engagement with their community, ease of walking, street repair, and air quality. As noted before, we're able to benchmark our results against cities and counties in the NRC's national database. 22 categories had higher or much higher ratings than the national benchmark in 2023. Higher ratings included Bloomington as a place to work, snow removal, drinking water, employment opportunities, and ease of travel by car. There were only two ratings that received lower ratings than the national benchmark, and they were the amount that people shared their opinions online and how often they shopped online. When asked about the quality of life, 84% of respondents rated it as excellent or good. This was similar to last year's rating. And Bloomington as a place to live remained within the margin of error at 88%. Your neighborhood remained the same as last year at 89%, and overall image or reputation of Bloomington inched up to 75%. When asked if they would remain in Bloomington for the next five years, the response landed within the margin of error at 83%. And those who would recommend living in Bloomington remain stable from last year at 88%. Scores for Bloomington as a place to raise children came in at 81%, down 4% from last year's rating. Satisfaction rating for Bloomington as a place to retire rose by 3% to 68%, and Bloomington as a place to visit remained unchanged at 77%. So there were several key findings coming out of this year's survey, and I'm going to cover those now, starting with key finding number one. Residents continue to identify safety as an important focus area, and they feel safe in Bloomington. Scores here remain strong in most areas. 76% of respondents reported feeling safe in Bloomington, relatively unchanged from last year. The overall scores were similar to the national benchmark. Feeling safe in your neighborhood during the day held steady from last year at 94%. And feeling safe in Bloomington's commercial areas during the day was 86%, down 2% from 2022. Feeling safe from property crime inched upward to 77% in 2023. Feeling safe from violent crime also inched up to 81%. And feeling safe from flood, fire, and other natural disasters rose by 5% this year, above the margin of error and in the top quartile of communities nationwide. 
When it comes to public safety services, ratings for all of these services rose this year. The police score improved by 2%, ranking it in the top one-third of all jurisdictions nationwide. Crime prevention rose above the margin of error from 72% to 77%. And the rating for fire services rose by 2% this year to 96%. The satisfaction rating for fire placed it in the top one-third of cities and counties in the nationwide database. Our next key finding was that Bloomington's economy continues to be a strong community feature. As in past years, several ratings within the economy category were higher than ratings observed in the national benchmark, including Bloomington as a place to work, employment opportunities, which ranked 15, number 15 nationally, and shopping opportunities, ranking at number 26 nationally. This next question in the economy area asked what impact, if any, the economy would have on family income in the next six months. Last year, those responding that the impact would be very or somewhat positive dropped down to 10%. This year, the very or somewhat positive responses rose above the margin of error, with 16% of respondents stating that the economic impact would be very or somewhat positive on their family income. An additional 43% were neutral. The score for a variety of housing options increased by 4% to 65%, and that was good enough to rank it in the top 20% in the nationwide database. And with a 44% approval rating, the availability of affordable quality housing in Bloomington ranked among the top 20% of cities in the nationwide benchmark and number one among our peer cities. Our key finding number three was that residents value the city's utility infrastructure. And this has been a recurring theme in the NCS throughout the years. Utilities is an area where Bloomington traditionally has done very well, and it has continued to do so in the 2023 survey. Respondents gushed out their praise of Bloomington's drinking water with 2023 ratings of 92%. That's number one in the NRC's nationwide database. Stormwater management, also number one in the nationwide database with an 89% approval rating. And with a score of 91%, sewer services was in the top 10% of jurisdictions nationwide, and again, number one amongst our peer cities. And when it comes to waste management, garbage collection received excellent or good ratings from 83% of respondents, a 4% increase from 2022. Recycling came in at 81% and yard waste pickup scored a 79% satisfaction rating. And our key finding number four was that residents appreciate Bloomington's health and wellness opportunities. These scores in the health and wellness category all rose from 2022. The availability of preventive health services rose above the margin of error by 6% to 71%. And the availability of affordable quality mental health care increased by 10% to 58%, good enough to rank it in the top 20% of communities nationwide. And one of the re ways residents stayed healthy this past year was by taking advantage of the city's parks and recreational opportunities. 86% of respondents again rated the overall quality of the city's parks and recreation opportunities as excellent or good. And 81% of residents were pleased with the availability of paths and walking trails good enough to rank it in the top quartile nationwide. And in the top 25% nationwide was recreational opportunities, which rose 2% to 79%. The ratings for city parks dropped slightly to 83% this year. Recreation programs or classes remained steady at 78%. And 69% of respondents rated recreation centers or facilities as excellent or good. And now we're gonna take a look at the city's governance scores. Bloomington's overall direction moved up 2% from 2022 to 64%. The ratings for overall confidence in city government was also up 2% to 58%. And when it comes to the city's overall customer service, that score was up by 2% as well to 83% in 2023. And that score places Bloomington in the top 25% of communities in the national database. In these ratings on various aspects of the city's governance, most scores landed within the margin of error, with the exception of the value of services for taxes paid, and that category dropped by 6% to 56% in 2023. I also want to note that several categories listed here landed in the top one-third of the nationwide benchmark, and they included treating residents with respect, treating all residents fairly, informing residents about issues facing the community, being open and transparent to the public, 
and the job that Bloomington government does at welcoming resident involvement. Ratings for city services generally remain stable from 2022, with the exception of public information, which rose by 5% to 76%, and code enforcement, which increased by 11% to 60%. Scores for the city services listed here were comparable to the national benchmarks, with the exception of natural areas preservation, and preservation of natural areas ranked at the top 10% of jurisdictions nationwide and number three in the Peer Cities group. In the category of built environment, new development earned excellent or good ratings from 57% of respondents, well-designed neighborhoods rose 3% to 69%, and overall appearance of Bloomington came in at 72%. And now we're going to move on to the mobility category, and we'll start with street repair, um, because this has had an interesting history over the years. This is one category that dropped significantly in 2023. Ratings decreased by 72%, or not 72%, by 17% from 2022, from 58% to 41%. And we have seen a similar kind of dip happen in the past, uh, particularly back in 2014. And we conducted a follow-up survey in the fall of that year and found a correlation between the duration and the severity of the preceding winter's weather and people's perception of the scores when they're taking the survey in late April and May. And so also the survey doesn't differentiate between city roads, state roads, county roads too. So it's, it's hard to know exactly what their, this, what their perception of, of, of each of the different roads without actually going in and asking specifically. So we have seen some correlations there between winter weather and, and uh, people's perceptions of the roads and potholes and that sort of thing. Um, speaking of winter weather, snow removal. Uh, scores slid a little bit this year, but they were still well within the margin of error. Even so, the 81% satisfaction rating was higher than the national benchmark, ranking in the top 15% of jurisdictions nationwide. And in traffic enforcement, that grew by 4% to 71% in 2023. That was good enough to place it in the top one-third of jurisdictions nationwide and number four among our peer cities. In other mobility-related categories, ease of travel by car in Bloomington grew by 7% to 86% this year. And that score is higher than the national benchmark in the top 20% and number three in the peer cities' rankings. Ease of walking in Bloomington, though, dropped by 10%. And ease of travel by bicycle was virtually unchanged at 59%. Now, in 2020, the National Community Survey added questions about inclusivity and engagement. And let's take a look at those scores right now. 61% of respondents rated the sense of community in Bloomington as excellent or good. And that's up 2% from 2022. And while many of the ratings in inclusivity and engagement remain steady, several increased by more than the margin of error. Attracting people from diverse backgrounds increased by 6% to 78%, and taking care of vulnerable residents also rose by 6% to 70%. Also, you'll note that three categories ranked higher than other communities in the national benchmark. They were attracting people from diverse backgrounds, valuing and respecting residents from diverse backgrounds, and taking care of vulnerable residents. But then when we start to take a look at the numbers demographically, and, and so I, I wanted to give you just a quick overview of these numbers by the race and ethnicity uh, demographic, they do tell a different story here. In the category of attracting people from diverse backgrounds, you can see that while the scores for white respondents remain stable and even increased over the years, we've seen drops since 2021 for members of our BIPOC communities. Same goes for valuing residents from diverse backgrounds. The scores by people identifying as white have gone up over the past three surveys, but scores by those identifying as BIPOC have eroded. And again, the same trend held true in the category of making all residents feel welcome. And there is actually a 16% gap this year in the scores of excellent or good between people who identify as white and people who identify as BIPOC. Scores over time are being tracked in this area for the Bloomington Tomorrow Together strategic plan in the area of welcoming connected community. And finally, there were several custom questions from this year's survey that I want to share with you right now. The first one asked, in a typical day, how often do you use the following modes of transportation for work or personal reasons? This was something that our public works department asked for. And the most popular responses were gas and diesel vehicles, walking, and biking. This next question came from Public Health, and it asked response, respondents to describe how much of a problem various issues 
have been for them in the past year. Top on the list was depression, anxiety, or feelings of sadness, with 20% of respondents saying that these were major or moderate problems for them. And 19% of respondents reported that social isolation, loneliness, and grief were major or moderate problems. And this is consistent with the recent U.S. Surgeon General report on public, the public health crisis of isolation, loneliness, and lack of connection in our country, and that this connection fundamentally affects our mental health and physical health and can even increase our risk of premature death. The next set of questions asks residents to rate public art that celebrates diversity and public events that celebrate diverse perspectives and cultures in Bloomington. And two thirds of respondents scored both categories as excellent or good in Bloomington. And then a final custom question asked whether respondents agreed or disagreed with the statement, I make a living wage enough to meet my basic needs. 85% of respondents strongly or somewhat agreed, 6% strongly disagreed. And by the way, this question and the previous set of questions will be monitored for progress in the city's BTT strategic plan. So that is a look at the results from the 2023 National Community Survey of Bloomington residents. The full survey results are posted on the city's website at bloomingtonmn.gov. Just search for 2023 survey. And in response to a request from one of the council members, I did include in your packet, I gave you uh, all uh, packets, binders, and I did include the results, the breakdown by council district. So you have those results there. And then finally, I just wanted to talk very briefly about next steps going forward. So I've mentioned we've been doing this survey now for, this is our 12th survey with the National Research Center. Um, I did have an opportunity to meet with staff from NRC Polko to debrief on, on some of the things that we've been finding, some of the trends that we've been seeing with this survey. Decline in response rate is one of the biggest trends. It used to be back in the 2012 to probably 2015, 16 timeframe, we were seeing response rates of anywhere between 35 and 40 percent. We're not seeing that anymore. We're, we saw 16 percent this year. So the, the response rates have declined significantly. So I've talked to them about that. Um, one of the reasons perhaps may be they used to do a fourth mail or a reminder postcard to remind people you got the survey. Uh, please fill it out. Uh, they no longer do that. Uh, and then also uh, the demographic participation. Um, the NRC does weight the results to reflect the demographics of the population, but we are concerned about the lack of participation by certain demographic groups within Bloomington. So we'll be reassessing this survey instrument in 2024 and looking at our options. Um, and so with that, I will stand for questions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for the the yearly update on this. Appreciate it, and appreciate the the comments about the declining rate of participation. wasn't sure if that was a matter of the the way the survey was administered, or the fact that people don't fill out surveys anymore, or a combination of the two. And I think that, that probably is is the case. Uh, also, glad to see you had the discussion with him about trying to make sure that we reach all the different diverse populations within the city. That's an important thing, and and can't be overlooked. Council questions, comments on all this. Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. I've got three real quick ones. Um, on page nine, um, we have this uh, this balancing performance and importance, and it has uh, you know on the one axis the quality, and on the on the other axis the importance uh, by percentage. And uh, it's always taken me every year when I see that on the bottom, you know, especially all the money we've invested around um, inclusivity and engagement, that 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 is so low. Um, so I, I don't know if, if that's just a, a matter of the instrument this is weighted or just I mean, if you could help me understand what that means as a policymaker. If it's just, yeah, it's basically what they're seeing based on the survey results and how they kind of fall within the other categories that they have. And so, like you said, that one particular one, even though it's still on the higher end of that area in terms of quality and then on kind of getting toward that section in terms of importance where it's kind of falling into, yeah, this is very important and high quality. It is still the lowest of the those 10 facets right now that uh, that we're scoring on. Okay. Um, again, yeah. Yeah. it's another conversation to have with, the, with those, those folks when you get them together. And then my other question is around the, um, you know, I was really excited to see that we had 83% uh, with the garbage rating. Um, yeah. 
Uh, I like that. But what are other cities doing that are, are rated higher than us? You know, either peer or from the national. Is there a way to? And I'm not. And I'm not looking for an answer with that today. But I'm just curious about that. There's a number of ones. I'm like, well, what are other cities doing that you know kind of get that that score higher, or is it just you know like the snowplow piece? It's when you ask the ask the uh, uh, ask the question. Yeah, Mr. Mayor and City Council Member. I, I think that's something that uh, this is the next phase, right? When you get these scores like this, you hopefully you don't let those survey results just sit on the shelf and gather dust, right? But what you want to do then is start diving into the why behind and what else is going on in other communities. So, so that's kind of the next step. And then the last one I had, and maybe this is more of a, a question to the to the mayor or, or the manager, you know, seeing that drop in that 6% value for service for taxes paid, um, I just get concerned when I see something like that. And of course, there's a lot of other really good things on the rest of that page, but, you know, that kind of made me say, you know, why did folks respond that way? Who responded that way? Um, you know, because there could be a lot of reasons to kind of drive that, you know, um, given uh, the first question that I asked, too, as well. So um, I just want to make sure that there isn't that um, a misdirection in terms of, of what that, that survey piece looks like. So uh, those are my, my main questions. Thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I guess I just have a comment. Um, I'm really glad to hear that you're going to be working um, with this group to um, reevaluate the survey tool because I just, I mean, I think the mayor already said it, right? I don't think people fill out paper surveys the way they used to. I know we get all kinds of surveys in our house and, and mailers, and they go right into the recycling. Um, I also know that in different cultural communities, the, like, Filling something out in a written format is not the preference. Um, and so just thinking about different ways of collecting this information. And then, of course, we're doing, I feel like we are doing a lot of work on community engagement and, and with our Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging to better understand what the barriers are, the challenges are, the concerns are, which it is that deeper layer then. Like, this just is a, a snapshot, right? And so... Um, it's one piece of information that we can use to inform our strategies, but it's not the only piece of information, and it's not perfect, right? So um, just wanted to make that comment and appreciate that, appreciate that you guys are going to be looking at different kinds of ways to collect this information. Thank you. Others? Well, thank you All right. once again, and uh, look forward to the follow-up uh, as within the city structure itself, but also within the Bloomington Tomorrow Together strategic plan to see how this applies and feeds into that and, and channels some of that work. I think that's an important next step. This is These, these all can't be standalone kind of things. We've got to make sure that it's all integrated in a lot of different ways. And so I'm, I'm glad to hear that it is being considered in, in a few of the questions and look forward to seeing how we use this as, as a tool to advance our Bloomington Tomorrow Together um, goals and, and objectives within the city. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. <clears throat> Council, up next, we have made it to the consent business now that it's uh, 10 minutes after, 12 minutes after 8 o'clock. Item 3 is our consent business. Councilmember D'Alessandro has our consent agenda this evening. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I didn't hear about any holds. Of course, as always, traditionally, I will hold 3.1 just to make um, an opportunity to make some recognitions there. But otherwise, uh, if yes, go ahead. So, Mayor, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not going to hold it, uh, the, the 3.2. I'll bring it up in the uh, uh, in our um, uh, policy and issue uh, updates piece. All right. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member D'Alessandro. Just to clarify, you, you're you're not going to bring it up, okay? Um, cool, great. So, <laughs> anybody else not going to bring something up? <laughs> just, I would like to not bring up three point four. No, just kidding. Get a little cheeky. Uh, okay. Well, if there aren't any other holds, then um, I'd like to uh, move to adopt. Uh, items 3.2 through 3.10 uh, on the consent agenda this evening. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Carter to accept tonight's consent business as stated. 
No further council discussion at this time. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries at 7-0. Councilmember D'Alessandro, item 3.1. Wonderful. Well, yes. I'm, I mean, there's a lot on this, uh, uh, as always. Um, we have a generous population of p folks here in Bloomington. Um, always uh, thrilled to be able to say thank you in particular. Um, among, obviously, the donations that, uh, that are on the uh, agenda tonight include... Um, the wonderful presentations we had today uh, from the Mirror Perry Gallery, Gallery and, and Rex, as well as the Lions Club. Um, so obviously we, we uh, acknowledge them directly. But other things that include here um, uh, are um, uh, BPD Honor Guard, uh, the canine unit. Everybody supports the Ble Bloomington Police in lots of different ways. Um, our summer FET donations are a part of our, our consent item this year as well. Um, thank you to everybody that supported that. Um, I, I know some of you didn't put your names on here. Uh, you went anonymous, and I totally appreciate that. And so, uh, But summer FET was a hit, uh, and um, that has a lot to do with people in the community stepping up to support that. Um, and then uh, there's other things around... Um, uh, a senior program. Uh, I know that um, it, uh, based on what I understand, we lost a, a community member, uh, uh, Arlene Jakeman, and there were lovely gifts presented uh, to our senior programs in that person's memory. Uh, and uh, we also have a uh, $3,500 donation for from the American Legion uh, for Veterans Appreciation. So just a lot of really wonderful causes uh, and support from around the community. So just really want to thank everybody um, who does that. Um, lots of times we don't know who you are, but we want you to know you're appreciated nonetheless. So with that, I'd very happily move uh, to adopt item 3.1 on our consent agenda. Second. Thank you. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Martin to accept item 3.1 on the consent business. I, I will make the comment, and thank you for your comments, Councilmember D'Alessandro, we agree completely. I think it says so much, I and mean, we, we heard uh, a $25,000 donation from the Lions Club. We mirror Perry Galley with that wonderful piece of art. There are literally five and a half pages worth of people who donated to Summer Fed, everywhere from $10 all the way up to $10,000 by the American Legion Post 550. It just shows the, 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 the giving nature of this community. And we just, we just heard survey results about the people's involvement and, and feeling of belonging to the community and so on. Uh, I think this speaks volumes to that in terms of um, our residents and what they, you know, you, you put your money where your mouth is, and that's what our residents are doing, and it's greatly appreciated. So You're here. Uh, so we have a, a, a motion and a second to accept item 3.1. Is there any other comments on this? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you, Councilmember D'Alessandro. We will move on to item four on our agenda. This is our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And we have one public hearing this evening. This will be a item 4.1 is a public hearing on earned sick and safe leave time code amendments. Before the hearing, uh, I think we've got a presentation by Amir Malik, our compliance manager. Good evening and welcome. Hello. Good morning, Mayor and members. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. <laughs> I'm thinking about tomorrow already. Oh, was that prosthetic or what? <laughs> <laughs> We're not there yet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm I'm here to present on the uh, proposed amendments for the earn sick and safe leave time, and. Uh, yeah, let's get started. So uh, the background for this is um, state passed a uh, statute on paid sick time, sick and safe time. And previously, you know, St. Paul, Bloomington, Minneapolis, Duluth had passed citywide uh, ordinances. Ours became effective July 1st. Um, here in the city attorney's office, we uh, do the compliance. The last year, we've been meeting with hundreds and hundreds of businesses to go over um, the ordinance. Uh, now that the state, though, has passed its own, 
we felt the fair thing to do, especially to Bloomington businesses, is just to align our ordinance with the state. So then there can never be a concern that, hey, we're following state law, but we're not, you know, we're violating Bloomington law. So with the way this is set up, our proposed amendments, that's impossible. <laughs> it could never happen that someone is following the state and they're violating the Bloomington ordinance. So um, the statewide program is very similar to uh, Bloomington. Uh, you know, they've even asked, had asked some of staff to help with uh, training and things like this. Um, but I, I'll list here are some of the changes that we are proposing. These would come into effect on the same day as the state. So we would keep our current ordinance until January 1st, and then we would be following the state ordinance if this is approved by council. So I've listed eight changes. There are four here. Um, and as you can see from the first one, we're really trying to align. Even the name, we're just, you know, why cause any confusion? So we're keeping the same. We're changing our name to the same as the state. Um, you'll see even the descriptions of who's covered. Um, on the next slide, you'll see other changes that have been made. And then everything, you know, we try to the T to have it line up with what the state is saying. Are there any questions about these changes before I go on? Or would you? And I, I did have a question on number five there that reduces from five to one the number of employees a business must have to be required to provide earned sick and safe time. That was an extensive discussion here at the council, and we did talk about that quite a bit. And I think we settled on five, and I think we ranged all the way up to 12 or 20 or so, and but we, we eventually settled on five. Is that uh, a, a, a change from that five to one that puts us in compliance with the state? Is that a requirement at the state level? So regardless of the number that we have, that number at the state level would be one, and that would be the number that would have to be a uh, adhered to. Is that correct? Yeah. So if, for instance, I guess if we stayed at five, uh, a Bloomington business that was at, let's say, three and then not giving si earn sick and safe leave would be violating state law, but would not be violating our ordinance. So, I mean, we could do that and we would, you know, but that's what would happen. So state law would supersede anything that we did in the first anyway. So it just simply makes sense for us to reduce from five to one that number in our ordinance. Yeah, the just the overall what we're trying to do is reduce administrative burden. Like for businesses, they have a lot of other things going on, and this makes it easy, you know, for them to understand that follow the state law, you're cool with Bloomington. Very good. Councilmember Loman. So with, with seven, I, I thought we had dealt with that in, um, by, by either getting rid of that. Is, is that different than what we have um, in our statute? I thought we had done, or pardon me, not statute, but in our ordinance. Uh, is there something different with the, how that, that, that's being administered? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, Mayor, Council Member Lohman. What we had, which was different and, in my opinion, better than like Minneapolis and others, is if the employer provided health insurance to the employee, then they could be required to provide documentation. And for instance, in other cities, even if there was no insurance, you would have to provide documentation. The state got rid of even the insurance part. The state said, if it's going to be a burden, regardless of insurance, no insurance, if it's going to be a burden on the employee, or if they didn't go to the doctor at all, then they don't have to produce any documentation. They can, other than they can just have a written statement to the employer saying, I am using my earned sick and safe time for a qualified reason. 
thanks for that clarification. Uh, you know, this is I have the same question the mayor had on that one, but I, 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 su I suppose that that would supersede anything that we would come up with. So I guess we'd have to go back and try to maybe add it to our, our policy or something like that as we uh, uh, look for legislation. Yeah, okay. Councilmember D'Alessandro? Um, at, the, at the risk of sounding flippant, which I don't mean to be, um, is there anything that is in here that we do have an, op an option on? Because I just would rather get to the stuff that we might be able to keep that's in our stuff as opposed to like – worrying about all the things that it doesn't matter because the state's going to override us anyway. Is there, can we just cut to that? I don't know if there is anything, maybe there's not. You're like, maybe you just have to do all of this and that's where we're at. Any help would be appreciated so we could kind of get to the nuts. Well, what I heard from Mr. Malik is there were the eight things and I think we're looking at the eight here and, um, so there's no option, though, in my in, yeah. am I interpreting that correctly? There's no option for us to say, yeah, we'd like to keep the stuff we had. No, I, I think that is the correct interpretation. Okay, great. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Malik? Uh, uh, Mayor, uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro, the way the law ended up coming out from the state is there was nothing that Bloomington did that was more generous, I guess you could say, to employees than what the state was proposing. So like it wasn't a situation, for instance, where Bloomington said you can have uh, 60 hours of uh, sick and safe time, and then the state was saying 48 hours. Then keeping the Bloomington one would give you more, you know, more hours. In this situation, no. It, that's it never happened so anything we keep um would just be would just result in an employer violating the state law but not violating bloomington ordinance so we're not suggesting that all right all right onward it's gonna move here we go so uh, j just finishing off with, uh, you know, what our next steps are. We, are, you know, we're going to uh, distribute updated posters um, and educational materials to Bloomington employers and employees. Uh, reach out to and engage with employers regarding changes, mailings, the one-on-one -on -one meetings, emails, the Bloomington briefing. Also, reach out and engage with employees and the community using relationships with our partners. And we, we have our city website where we keep everything. So that's the plan. And, uh, you know, there's our QR code to our site that we keep on our, our posters and everything that we distribute. And that's what we are proposing. Very good. Council, any questions? Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just a quick question on the posters. The posters are a requirement that people post those in their place of employment, correct? Yes. And that's the same as all of the other cities. They all have their own posters, and the state has their own poster, correct? Well, I'm, at some point, I assume the state will have a poster for this, but I don't think it's yet. Okay, thank you. Council, anything additional? If not, thank you, Mr. Malik. Thank you. As I mentioned when we began, uh, this is a public hearing. Right now I'd like to open the public hearing at item 4.1 regarding the earned sick and safe leave time code amendments. Is there anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak on item 4.1 this evening? Mr. Sable, do we have anyone on the phone wishing to speak on item 4.1? Uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, no one on the line. Last call for anyone in the chambers? Council, no one on the phone, no one coming forward in the chambers. I would look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.1. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Nelson to close the public hearing on item 4.1. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Council, any additional questions, comments on this? Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, just a couple quick comments on this. Um, I gotta be honest, I don't see why we don't just eliminate this from our ordinances it's a, a state has taken over this space if we talk about reducing the administrative burden the least burdensome for bloomington businesses is to just have one law the state law 
and I think I said this when I voted for this because I'm not against it, um, but this should be something the state's doing, and lo and behold, they listen to us. So um, I don't know what else we should say that they should do. Maybe they'll listen to us again. It seems to me, you know, and that, that was one of the reasons I asked about the posters. I mean, if you're an employer that works in multiple communities, you could have as many as six, seven posters for one law, for one rule that you have to manage and hang up there. I also hear that, you know, we're, we're going to spend time and money for engagement and outreach and working with employers and things like that. You know, we're, we're talking about our budget during this cycle, and we do talk about things that, you know, maybe we could stop doing. And I think it's pretty low-hanging fruit to stop doing something the state's doing. And as Councilmember D'Alessandro noted, there's nothing of discretion here. There's nothing that we're having a choice about. The state law covers all of this. Let the state run it. That's my opinion. Thank you, Councilmember Nelson. That's a good point. Uh, I will turn to um, either Ms. Mandershad or Mr. Verbrugge and ask, so once we get past these 90-some-odd days before we get to the first of the year when the state law kicks into effect, is there a, is there a, a city role in terms of uh, oversight, compliance, enforcement, or is this completely on the state? Uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, uh, it's a good question. I think the um, I think the ordinance should stay in effect at least until the state uh, law goes into effect. That's one of the things we want to do and why we're asking you to make these changes tonight. I think we probably want to spend a little bit of time doing an assessment uh, to make sure there isn't a gap that'll be created um, somehow uh, if we if we do repeal our ordinance in favor of letting the state just occupy the field. Um, and it, it would not be uh, unprecedented for a city to say that uh, we have an ordinance on the book because it's an expression of our values and uh, we, we want the community to know that this is something that we believe in. And if there isn't additional uh, regulatory requirement that is placed upon us based on that, then uh, you may want to leave it in place for reasons other than just uh, not wanting to be duplicative. But um, I think that unless a city attorney has something additional uh, to respond, we can certainly take a look and do an assessment if the council would like us to do that leading up to January 1st. Ms. Mandershine, anything else to add? Uh, Mayor members, uh, there are th other examples uh, of things that we have in our in our um, code of ordinances that are um, consistent with powers that other entities have and programs that other entities have. Uh, this is something that um, we have put on our books, obviously, and you all adopted it. We didn't know at the time that the state was going to adopt its program. The state is going to be seeking to implement this program and enforce it statewide. Uh, we know that in Bloomington we have a lot of employees that have not historically been provided with access to leave and have not had compensated absences. So we know that we will create uh, more enforcement um, at, at and within the city of Bloomington by having this in our code of ordinances. So it is my understanding that those cities and communities that have their own version of earned sick and safe leave have been encouraged to keep it um, and bolster the ability to enforce and implement it statewide. And also certainly welcome the compliance manager up to the podium if you'd like to add anything more. Mr. Malik, anything to add? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, no, other than to say that the, the State Department of Labor uh, specifically has asked Bloomington to enforce. Um, they spoke with us this year, staff, and they said we don't have the capacity and we're looking to have our partners enforce. And so none of the cities are dropping their enforcement. We have like monthly meetings where all of them talk and everything. What they are doing is they're aligning with the state, but the state has yeah, it was just told us directly. They just cannot, uh, they don't have that capacity. Well, uh, to Council Member, I appreciate that. I appreciate the information. Um, to Council Member Nelson's point, um, I, I would appreciate over the next 
90 days before the first of the year, an, an evaluation of what, what it would mean in terms of um, enforcement, in terms of compliance among our, our businesses, uh, in terms of the cost of the program, the du duplicative nature of the program, just an evaluation of whether or not we should be continuing this, and I think we should have that discussion here at the council level. If it is a, a very obviously duplicative service that's offered at the state, and we're offering it here at, at the city level, um, I think it's worth the conversation to have whether or not we want to continue doing it. Mm -hmm. Mayor members, um, we all know how much the city manager uh, likes data. So from the very beginning of this program, we've been collecting data, um, not only on outreach, but also to many other types of data, um, complaints that have come in, concerns that have, been com that have come in. So we have that information and we'll continue obviously to track it with regard to existing staff resources. We have uh, a lawyer and a paralegal uh, that spend part of their time on this um, particular program. They also handle several of our other programs that have compliance aspects to them. For example, Opportunity Housing Ordinance, which we'll be hearing about tonight. Uh, there are uh, administrative hearings. You all know we have a layer of administrative conferences. Uh, the Compliance Division has been handling those for the past couple of months. And there are other smaller programs that they're also involved in. So as we roll out more programs uh, and we uh, become... Uh, we are very busy in legal, and if we have the opportunity uh, to have our <clears throat> our assistant attorneys um, be not handling appeals, and we have the ability to take them out of their workload and put them into the compliance manager's workload, it's a cleaner break, and it provides uh, more access for our community members who have questions and trying to understand and work through compliance with our various programs. So we can certainly provide a more uh, thorough update, but just a, a high-level um, information about the types of things that Amir and others spend their day doing. No, and I appreciate that, and I under understand that as well. I, I do think uh, if we could bring back for discussion and uh, bring back for discussion that type of evaluation, those types of things to consider, and perhaps the polar sides, the polar edges of what this might be, but also what a middle ground, you know, something in the middle might look like as well to, to meet some of the needs that we have within the, the legal department and with everything else going on. Councilmember Lohman? Just real quick, if we do do that piece, which I'm supportive of, uh, what you've mentioned, Mayor, I would really be interested to see if the state would be willing to subsidize some of that enforcement uh, that we have, or like we have with uh, public health, where we've worked in Richfield and Edina, provide that service for multiple jurisdictions uh, so that it's a uh, uh, win-win uh, for our taxpayers. A good suggestion there as well, Councilmember. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I guess I'm just curious uh, when the state passed the policy. Um, you know, obviously, there's only a handful of cities who have resources for compliance, and there are now many, many cities and towns that don't have those resources. And so, how are they expecting to enforce and have compliance across the state? And then, why do some cities then need to spend their own resources versus um, other cities who will get state support then? Uh, Mayor members, there are examples of that um, throughout the way that the city of Bloomington operates in that we've had, we have delegated authority from state agencies and other examples of that so that we can, um, in some cases, bring the same level of service to the city of Bloomington and in other cases um, more. And it's been a choice to do that. So, Council, are, are we in agreement? We'd like to see an analysis of this and perhaps have that conversation sometime in the next... 90 days as we get to the first of the year when this would be in, in place. Is that, you got it? Okay. And the 90 days that's legitimate between now and the first of the year when it is. the state law will go into effect? Okay, very good. All right. Council, additional conversation on this? If not, uh, we do have uh, information here, and I'd be, I would look for a motion, uh, look for action to adopt these changes so we're in compliance for the next 90 some odd days before the first of the year. Uh, so look for action on that from the council tonight. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you. This is very minor, and I actually don't expect anybody to go for it right now, but it would really be nice if we just acknowledge that there are other posters, and if you hang any of the posters, you're cool. <laughs> like, like, 
you know, it, because seriously, to, to have to have seven posters for a business is for the same thing. Again, I don't expect it to be changed tonight. Something to look at later. But um, Councilmember Nelson, we did hear that part of the uh, the work plan over the next ninety days uh, yeah. was was education. Perhaps we could direct staff to make sure, as part of the education, uh, to clarify the poster issue as it as it that would rears be its ugly head. How yeah. about that? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> It's actually, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Nelson, an initiative to make sure that everybody is buying much larger poster boards at work. So no. it's, it's an economic stimulus action. City Manager, but. we prepare them in our own print shop. <clears throat> we have used some cutting edge technology that withstands moisture. <laughs> Seriously, it's I put an addition on my shop. building for the posters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but just to be clear, Mayor, um, I heard a bit of timing here. So what we're looking at tonight our existing code is going to stay in place until the end of this year. This ordinance is, has a delayed effective date of January 1st. Uh, so this, this particular effective, this, these changes don't flip on until the first of the year when the statewide ESST becomes effective as well. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And, and I, think, I, I think it would be worth it to, to pass this this evening, to have them in place in the event as we continue this discussion, if we decide to to eliminate the service locally we're or or not but then we're, we're, we're still set up for january 1st one way or another we can deal with that then but i think it does make sense to to put these in place now to, to pass this now council member d'alessandro uh thanks mr mayor um i'm fine to um to go ahead and do that i agree with that i um i would like to know um if we have any conversation through um, our lobbying organizations of the League of Minnesota Cities or anything like that, um, re like asking slash requiring slash begging the folks at the state level to actually fund the thing that they passed, uh, the enforcement of the thing that they passed, if that would be great. I don't know if, if you all know if that's on the docket for us in terms of our legislative priorities, but it, that I think that informs the question we're asking here, right? Um, we may have to take up the mantle of enforcement if they choose not to, but I think we would prefer that they either do like build out an enforcement infrastructure or they fund it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know, do we have that on our docket for legislative priorities at this time? I think uh, even before we go to get on the docket, I think it's worth asking the question of the mm -hmm. state, what their plans are and uh, I mean, they say they can't do this. Well, what, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. My, my, my assumption there, Mr. Mayor, was just that they, they passed the ordinance, but they haven't gotten into the yeah. details of, like, how they're actually going to execute it, and maybe that's coming. That's kind of my point. Mm -hmm. If it's coming, then we could wait for it and then figure it out. Yeah. But I didn't know if they're even planning to work on it in the next session. Um, maybe a conversation. Part of this uh, evaluation is a conversation with uh, MLC or the League of Minnesota Cities and try and figure out where we might be with that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. And Council with, oh, do you have another question? Councilmember Lomans, one more question? Uh, that's what, yeah, if you're all right, I was, if we're okay uh, to move it then. Councilmember yeah. D'Alessandro, please. Very good. Okay, we have a, uh, I am um, moving that we adopt an ordinance amending Chapter 23 of the City Code related to earn sick and safe, safe time. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Lohman to adopt an ordinance amending Chapter 23 of the City Code related to earn sick and safe time. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Council Member D'Alessandro, summary publication. Yes, sir. Um, move to adopt a resolution authorizing summary publication of the ordinance amending Chapter 23 of the City Code related to earn second safe time. Second. Motion by Council Member D'Alessandro, second by Council Member Lohman for cut summary publication on item 4.1. No further council discussion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malik, and thanks for the update, and Council, thanks for the conversation. Interesting interesting perspective here, so thanks, Council Member Nelson. That'll wrap up item four on our agenda and move us on to item five, our organizational business, and we have actually two items that are information only, just kind of updates and, and discussion, I think, tonight. First one is item 5.1, an update on our Opportunity Housing Ordinance. I see Carla Henderson, and I see Kenny Niemeyer. The first time you're in front of us, welcome. Please be gentle. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, council members. As you are aware, uh, this honorable body passed the Opportunity Housing Ordinance in 2019. As part of that requirement, the community development director is supposed to provide an annual update prior to October 1st. 
we're going to let Kenny give you most of those details. But um, as the mayor mentioned, you know, we are leading, as Ms. Kirby talked about, affordable housing in the country among our peer cities. And so um, in four short years, we've accomplished a lot. And Kenny will now turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members, City Manager. This evening, I'll be presenting the annual update, uh, the annual report on the ongoing implementation of the Opportunity Housing Ordinance. So we'll go through a brief overview of the ordinance, the incentives that are available and utilized by developers with a focus on the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. We'll go through OHO-related projects currently underway and give a quick update on recent housing developments. So you've seen this uh, this, gra or this spreadsheet before. Each year, HUD updates and releases the area median income for the Minneapolis-St. Paul-Bloomington Metropolitan Statistical Area. The Metropolitan Council uses the AMI to set ownership and rent affordability limits, and these limits establish affordability for our Opportunity Housing Ordinance units. As you can see, AMI increased from 2022 to 2023, although by a smaller amount than in 2021 to 2022. Uh, there was a 12.7% increase from 21 to 22, uh, just a 5.7% increase from 22 to 23. And as was stated last year, that large increase from 21 to 22 was a result of substantial regional and national increases in median family income, as well as the increase in inflation. So we're seeing that lesson here with these numbers from 23. So the OHO offers multiple options for developers to comply with requirements. The most frequently used option continues to be on-site development of the required affordable units. That's set at 9% of the total units for the development, uh, the total of dwelling units, and those units must be made available to households earning 60% or less of the area median income. Developers can also choose to make a payment in lieu based on the in lieu rate, which is currently set at $9.60 per square foot of leasable market rate unit square footage. Some developers are opting for this payment in lieu recently. Uh, one in particular, the Ardor, uh, is a development that paid the fee in lieu, and they also are utilizing the option to use that payment for uh, their own future development, which will include uh, those affordable housing units that were not in that original development. Uh, two other upcoming developments will likely be paying fee in lieu uh, directly into our affordable housing trust fund. And that funding can then be used to support future affordable housing activities. So on this slide, we'll see the, the two major categories of incentives that the OHA, OHO offers to developers. There are development standard flexibility incentives, which relate to the planning aspects of a development. And then there are financial incentives, which help with financial feasibility for proposed developments. Since you've last seen this graph, uh, we've added in 1801 American Boulevard and the incentives uh, that they utilized. Um, so they recently got, uh, got entitlement for that development. Uh, parking and TIF funding continue to be the most utilized incentives. You can see here 100% of developments took that parking stall reduction incentive. Uh, there has also been an increased interest lately uh, in project-based housing vouchers and affordable housing trust fund incentives. Um, so those are for developments upcoming, so they're not reflected here in this graph, but um, I'll point out um, back to this graph, incentives used by 1801 American Boulevard were some that hadn't been used much before, those include uh, expedited, uh, excuse me, the site area reduction, site width reduction, and open space reduction. So those were previously not frequently utilized. We're seeing more interest in those now. So on to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. We wanted to highlight this fund, which it was um, part of the implementation of the OHO. This fund is a powerful tool that the, the city can use to promote the creation of units with deep affordability and to preserve our existing existing units of naturally occurring affordable housing. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund has been successfully leveraged to support the development of 15 units affordable at 30% area median income. That's um, in terms of tracking, that's the lowest uh, level of affordability for our Metropolitan Council housing goals. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund has also helped preserve 306 units of 
uh, NOAA unit, nat uh, naturally occurring affordable units at affordability levels of 80% area median income. Uh, oh, excuse me. These, uh, these units were supported through the Affordable Housing Trust Fund's revolving loan fund, um, but the Affordable Housing Trust Fund also aims to provide housing stability support, and this will be um, undertaken as more funding sources are identified. So some of those potential sources that are coming in 2024 come in the form of the Local Affordable Housing Aid Program, which was passed by the state uh, legislature this year and will be first received by the city next year. Uh, and as previously mentioned, a few of these upcoming developments, housing developments that we have, are expected to choose the payment of fee in lieu to support uh, these programs that the Affordable Housing Trust Fund has. So next, we'll focus on the, uh, the housing nexus study. This is the analysis that estimates new affordable housing, uh, the demand generated for those new affordable housing units in response to new market rate residential developments. Um, so the results of this study, which was last completed in 2018, were used to set the required unit percentage and payment in lieu rate per square foot, which I had mentioned earlier. Stack are, staff are recommending a renewal of the housing nex nexus study so that we can reevaluate affordability benchmarks and continue to achieve the goals of the Opportunity Housing Ordinance. Uh, I'll also point out that at least one local funding source has been identified to support the cost of this study, which was around $72,000 in 2018, plus an additional $80,000 for testing and financial modeling of the policies that resulted from the OHO. So next, I'll highlight some upcoming uh, improvements and amendments to the Opportunity Housing Ordinance. Um, these are intended to improve clarity. There's some different uh, tranches of improvements and amendments that are coming. Um, and then on the, the right side, we'll see is the OHO compliance program, which was mentioned previously. So this is something that we're, we're meeting across departments. Um, we're meeting with legal, uh, the compliance manager, to discuss this. And we hope to bring these items back in front of you um, in quarter one of 2024. So this is ongoing work. Um, finally, I wanted to give an update on Metropolitan Council goals for development of affordable housing units. You'll see that we're, we've well exceeded our goal for 60% area median income units, which is fantastic. We're very close to achieving the goals on 50% area median income units, um, but we, are, we have a long way to go for 30% AMI. So um, that's why our Affordable Housing Trust Fund is such a powerful tool. It can get uh, that gap financing for projects that intend to include 30% AMI units. It can also be used as uh, leverage. So it, it, as that incentive stands, we can negotiate with developers to, if they want access to those funds, uh, we can push a little harder to ask for those 30% AMI units and promote more, uh, more of that development. And then just quickly, we'll go through some developments that were, uh, some were brought to you last year, just some uh, images and quick facts about these developments. So we've got updates on those. So you'll see Riser, uh, this one's almost wrapped up now. That was a, a, just a couple weeks ago. They're almost done. Uh, Oxboro Heights is well along its way. Uh, I'll point out those nine units at 30% AMI, those are nine of that 15 that I mentioned that the Affordable Housing Trust Fund helped secure. Noble Apartments, uh, also well on its way. The Ardor is uh, the the development that I mentioned that paid fee in lieu that will then that that developer will then use that uh, fee in lieu to to do a future affordable housing development. So they've just started construction on that first development, the Ardor, and then Carbon Thirty One uh, will be closing or opening, I should say, very shortly here in possibly in October. So a lot of progress on those developments, and there are more developments upcoming as I mentioned. Um, so we look forward to talking about those more with you all. So I'll stand for questions on the OHO. Thank you, Mr. Niemeyer. Well done, and we'll be we'll be gentle with the questions. I promise. I, I did have a couple of questions, though. You 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 started off with a discussion about the AMI. I have seen in the past, or or maybe I haven't. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think AMI is more general to the area, and I've seen numbers specific to Bloomington as well. Have those numbers changed, or have they been produced for for the the most recent time period? So thank you, Mayor, Council Members. My understanding with the AMI for Bloomington is that 
So HUD still sets AMI at the Metropolitan Statistical Area, but that 80% AMI limit um, is, in, in the case of our Metropolitan Statistical Area, is lower than the U.S. national median. So if I'll try and go back to that slide. There's an asterisk next to that number. Uh, went too far. Uh, around the 80% on the lower half of the screen. Mm -hmm. So we're actually, that's reflecting our metropolitan statistical areas, lower AMI versus the national uh, median. So that might be one level of specificity that you're thinking of, um, but I'll also mention that the Metropolitan Council is exploring this concept of affordability. <coughs> that's a conversation that they're having. They, they've gone out for survey on this of uh, talking about more localization of these affordability numbers, so changing that geographic area that they're using to, to assess that area median income. So that's a, that's a discussion that's ongoing. And, and I think that would be helpful too. I, I think from the, the MSA is, is one thing, and I think that's helpful, but I think the more specific uh, within our cities, especially the city the side of Bloomington, you know, perhaps for a smaller city, it would be more difficult to get the, those numbers, but I would hope for a city of 91,000 and the geographic size of Bloomington, we'd be able to, to carve those numbers out and understand a little bit better where we are within our city. Uh, the second question I had, a little more general, we heard from our county commissioner the hundreds of millions of dollars they have available for affordable housing and uh, wondering how much of that uh, we have our eye on here in Bloomington or has already come our way to Bloomington. There is a lot on the horizon, and I would say that that's state-level funding. So uh, thank you, Mayor, council members. Uh, one in particular that I mentioned already is the local housing, uh, local affordable housing aid. So they've given that the acronym LAHA, which apparently is going to stick. So that is from the metro area sales tax, and that funding in particular is an entitlement fund. So Bloomington will be receiving that fund and then the city can use that how it sees fit. So that, that can be a very powerful tool for housing affordability, especially with its interaction with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, the, the way that that at LAHA is written is that if those, fund, if those dollars end up in our Affordable Housing Trust Fund, they will be treated as spent. So there's more to come on that. The, the state's still working on a lot of the, the compliance, that the program itself, but um, it's an exciting development for affordable housing. There are a lot of other affordable housing programs that were passed in the most recent legislature. Some that I can think of off the top of my head is the there's a challenge program for affordable housing, uh, especially related to supportive housing, which we heard about the need of um, for, with previous speakers, in fact. Um, there's also funding at more local level w in terms of Hennepin County. Currently, they're working on utilizing the final amount of their uh, ARPA, SFLR dollars, which the commissioner spoke to, um, those are going, additional amounts of those funding are going to affordable housing. We also, um, in terms of city of Bloomington, with some of our existing developments are going out for uh, uh, brownfield cleanup grants, which in terms of that funding stack that affordable housing needs, I'm sure you've heard the funding sources for these developments keeps getting longer and longer and longer. Uh, more sources are needed to make these deals work. So at, at the Bloomington level, we're working with developers to go out for application to those funding sources. So those are at the county level, the Metro Metropolitan Council level, and then the state level with DEED. Good. That's that's all very encouraging. And I will we'll defer to you and your knowledge of the, the acronyms to, to make sure that we, uh, we we position Bloomington as we need to. Uh, and and on a more general discussion, given the, the work that Bloomington has done over the past 10 years and <coughs> how far out we are ahead of so many other communities, and I'm gonna put that measurement as roughly a country mile, <laughs> that I would hate for all of this state funding go to folks who are simply trying to catch up while we've been doing the hard work over the past decade here. And so um, we may need to have some conversations with our state legislative delegation and our county commissioner and, and the governor's office and so on to make sure that uh, Bloomington is recognized for the work that we have done and um, these resources don't simply go to other communities in an effort to catch up to what we've, what we've accomplished. So I think it's a, a worthwhile conversation to have with our friends. So other questions? Councilmember Council Member, uh, Lohman, Councilmember Mua, and then Councilmember D'Alessandro. Councilmember Lohman. Mayor, well stated, uh, making sure that we 
you know, get our, our, our just due uh, with the work we've been doing. I appreciate that, that statement, certainly support that. Uh, and I promise I will not ask any tough questions, even though that's not my, my tradition to do. I like to give folks the hot seat when they first get here. So I won't do that, I promise. So um, looking at, um, I just had two questions, Mayor. Uh, so looking at the percentages of projects that util utilize incentive, more of a, just a question of understanding. So are we looking, when we look at this graph that you've got there, I think it's on page 7, uh, 256 of our, our packet. Um, uh, so is this to look back at all of the projects that we've ever done? So, for example, when I look at the parking stall reduction, 100% of all of the projects that came through used that reduction, whereas the floor area ratio bonus None of those projects uh, utilize that. Is that am I understanding that that correctly when I when I look at the at the graph? Thank you, Mayor Council Members. My understanding that that's for developments that have come post or opportunity housing ordinance implementation. So that would have been after twenty nineteen. Yeah, after twenty nineteen. Okay, um, and so um, I, I'm I'm always and I'm not looking for an answer today, but I'm always looking for ways in which that we can you know one improve those ones were zero, um, and then also as we look at these classifications that are out here, ones that you know in particular, if there's a way to boost those ones that um, uh, you know from an environmental standpoint have a better. Um, and that's more of a policy thing. I'm just kind of saying generally from the mayor, you know, make it better for from an environmental sustainability standpoint. So more of a, more of a comment on that one. And then um, my, my last question is around, um, I think it's, you have another slide here where we have, you know, kind of our, in terms of our goals um, from the Metropolitan Council, uh, page 11. Uh, and I look at that 30, you know, percent AMI. And one of the things I've always been concerned about um, uh, Mayor, when we uh, look at this number, we've got the 42 there. I know there's kind of a clock ticking behind the, the you know, behind the scenes, at least in my head. And, you know, <laughs> and so I always think to myself, well, how long do we have those 42 units of affordability? And I would love it um, uh, as we look at presentations like that, that we somehow keep that information in front of us, particularly of these low, there's ones that are harder to get, you know, the 30% AMI and the 50% AMI, um, because they're hard fought. Um, and then also when they roll off the rolls, I always get concerned about, uh, especially we've seen folks come before this, this body before and say, hey, you know, there's no place for me to roll to, um, you know, at that level. Um, that's one of the reasons why I like the you know, the permanent type, you know, and I know this is not a permanent type thing, uh, but that's just something I'm thinking about just, you know, just for this body to be aware, um, at least staff, maybe maybe staff behind the scenes has that awareness, but I just as a, as a policymaker don't have that awareness. So not really a question, more of a comment. So you're, you're getting off easy today, but I won't promise next time it's going to be that easy. Councilmember Mua. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, I just want to say, I never truly understand the impact of this opportunity housing ordinance until a, a neighbor of mine was able to take advantage of this. And it, it allowed her and her child to move to an apartment in town to stay close to their family so they could continue to have that family support. And so I think what we're doing is, is fantastic and it's showing because we're taking care of the people who live here, who grew up here and who want to raise their children here. So I appreciate the work we're doing with this. Um, uh, my, my question kind of, Runs along the same line as uh, <clears throat> Councilmember Lowman in the percent of projects that utilize incentive, uh, especially when it comes to the parking stall reduction and then the fact that there is zero impervious surface reduction. So people are reducing parking stalls, but they're still covering it up with cement. Is that kind of what I'm understanding out of that? <laughs> Thank you, Mayor and Council. One thing that I've, as I've met with the different departments and discussed some of these incentives as we're thinking about amendments and improvements, one thing that came up frequently is that a lot of these incentives have a very complicated interplay. So when you're talking about parking stall reduction, open space reduction, and impervious surface reduction, any change to one of those might change the other incentives. So I think that would what you've brought up is a really important thing for us to look at is uh, a closer eye to that interplay of those incentives. Okay. I think that makes totally sense. And uh, especially if we everyone is using parking stall reduction, I would love for us to be able to uh, better incentivize those, those other options. Um, and particularly for me, uh, if we're looking to reduce 
impervious safe or if we're looking to reduce the environmental impact that we have, you know, is there something transit related? I know we talked about this with Commissioner Goodell as well. Met Transit is in a different state, but it won't remain that way forever. And so as we continue to look at this uh, ordinance, how do we incentivize transit to or transit development on particular locations to reduce parking need, to reduce impervious surface? Uh, so that would be something I would love to see and understand as we look to the future. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I just wanted to respond to say absolutely on better incentives regarding transit. I'll also point out that a lot of external funding sources that developers seek have a great emphasis on transit. So you'd mentioned Met Council, their transit-oriented development grants will incentivize developers to be close to some of the transit improvements that Bloomington has seen. And then also at the state level for housing that's receiving or that's going out for uh, low-income housing tax credits, which is one of the if not the biggest tool that developers use to create affordable housing, they get points on their uh, on their application. It's a point-based system for selection for uh, re relevance to transit. So I think there's absolutely a place for local emphasis on that as well, just to reflect that emphasis at the state levels. Councilmember D'Alessandro and then Councilmember Martin. Councilmember D'Alessandro. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Nice to meet you. Thanks for being here. Um, so I, um, yeah, I think um, between Councilmember Mua and Councilmember Lohman, I, I heard some of the things that I was really interested in. Um, uh, I think um, we're at a point right now where, and I think I've said this before, uh, where I'd like to see us re recast um, some of these incentives to focus on, um, on, um, environmental justice initiatives I, I for example a uh, green roofs um solar panels on the roof um you know electric heaters and um you know and not doing gas services and other things like that i think um i think there's opportunity there i think we know that it's valuable from a from a um a public perspective to do that um and and i know that um it doesn't it doesn't necessarily um it doesn't necessarily like result. I mean, long term, it results potentially in less money spent as well. But it also um, is the right thing to do long term for the environment and for the folks that live there. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd very much want to see us consider some environmental specific um, incentivizing here, especially if we're using public dollars at the stage. Um, the other thing I would say about that, and, and this is probably more of a question for you, is um, are we actually hearing people coming to the table willing to get to 30% AMI? If these future developments that you're talking about, um, are we actually seeing it? Um, and, and, and if, if we are, um, you know, I'd love to get some kind of analysis of like why those people are planning to help us with that and what what's the difference right and how many of them are thinking about it from a rental perspective versus a home ownership perspective you know are there anybody is there anybody out there willing to like take a leap with us and say I'll build you a condo building even though the statutory warranty's out there because that's an incentive I'd be willing to spend my you know risk against if you're willing to throw some public dollars at it or something to that effect so we can solve kind of a combination of problems that we have right we have a home ownership problem we have which is a generational wealth issue we have a 30% AMI low like deeply affordable problem we do know that we have um uh, you know is issues of 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 density that we're trying to, you know, resolve. Um, I, I just feel like maybe we could think about those things kind of all together and be a little bit more holistic and find a couple of, of, of developers who might be willing to take a leap with us. I have no idea, Mr. Mayor, if, if we can help that problem in the state. I was told with no, so no uncertain terms that despite the fact that you know, the realtors and everybody that we've talked to would really like the state to back off that statutory warranty. It's not going to happen anytime soon. So what do we, what can we do to work around it? Can we do anything with the trust fund, with the dollars coming from Hennepin County, with this ordinance that can help us work around that? And if that's true, I would love to see it because I think um, a deeply affordable condo building that provides home ownership long-term is like 
that would be the holy grail of what we're trying to accomplish here on multiple on multiple levels. And so um, I don't know, I, but if we can think through that, I think that would be really ideal. So that maybe, I don't know if you know anything about what might be coming up and maybe that there's some cool things that you can think about that are on the horizon, but I'd love to hear about them. If not, just you could take that commentary. Thank you. Thank you, Mary and council members. So I wanted to first respond to your point of environmental justice and environmentally related incentives. I think what, what we have here with our current structure of the OHO is kind of an inverse incentive structure. So we have our code at market rate, and then we loosen the restrictions of that code when affordable units are offered past what is the base requirement. So uh, this in improving, or sorry, including environmental justice and environmentally related incentives is almost an inverse to that to that current structure. So I think there would have to be a retooling or perhaps uh, an addition to the way that the OHO is structured to have that be a component of what we're seeking from our developers. But I, but that's something that we can look at, I would say. I wanted to respond also to your point of why certain developers, or are there developers coming forward who are willing to do 30% AMI units? There are, the it's, it comes often down to the pro forma, what the financial performance of this development will be, and the way that they have to show that that's going to work is with public dollars, with public assistance. So that's why I mentioned the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. That's that funding that can get them to that point where their development will work with the inclusion of 30% of AMI units. I'll also mention in the slides I talked about uh, increased interest in project-based vouchers. That's one of the other ways that these developers are able to get that 30%. So in that case, the HRA of City of Bloomington converts some of their existing housing choice vouchers into project-based vouchers. So those vouchers are then housed in that development, um, ensuring that 30% AMI unit is available. Um, so there are developers willing to do the work, oftentimes they have to be very experienced in affordable housing development. They have to know where all of these affordable sources lie. As I said, that I, I, I'm reviewing uh, developments proposed for the, that, those remaining funds at Hennepin County for the COVID funds. One of the developments that I saw had 20 sources, 20 funding sources, and that's for them to, they had a 30% affordable units in that development. So what that means is they have to know where to go and that, what the steps are to get that funding. So. There's a willingness, but it takes a lot of experience. So to your point of attracting those developers, I think that's something that we should look into. And then finally, your point on incentivizing 30% um, AMI for ownership. One thing, and I know you've mentioned this, the statutory warranty on condo units. Um, I'm somewhat aware of that, but I don't know the details. But I do know with the OHO, uh, these requirements come into place when there's 20 units or more. So I, my understanding is that the majority of ownership developments in the city of Bloomington are fewer than 20. And in that case, that purview would fall under the HRA. And there is a lot of interest in the HRA to create ownership um, at those lower affordability levels. So I'll take that note as well. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, this is more just kind of a, a curiosity I'd love to learn more about as you're talking to the development community um, and maybe property owners. So obviously the Opportunity Housing Ordinance has provided enough levers to change things around the edges to get affordability projects across the finish line that wouldn't have otherwise. And I just think about the pace of change that we've seen in so many of our commercial nodes, especially in areas where we brought other tools to bear, like uh, through the federal government, uh, Opportunity Zones or the Gateway Development District or whatever it may be. So I just wonder... As, as kind of a thought exercise, uh, as you're talking to folks, if we really put the pedal to the metal with providing additional fl flexibility, especially down at the lower end of that utilization scale, uh, whether it's in terms of the height bonuses or open space reductions, whatever it is, what would it take where all of a sudden those properties we don't anticipate movement on anytime soon, suddenly those performers make sense and those properties may turn over for redevelopment sooner than we would think otherwise it may be an unacceptable level of flexibility that we need to provide to make that happen um, but if it's uh, if it's not um, outside the realm of possibility when we see what that would take in the end that's still producing additional affordability in the community because it'll be required to have those units inside of them so just it, it's something I'd be curious if you could sneak that into conversation as well to say uh, whether it's along Lindale Avenue or Portland American or Cedar Old Shock, 
how how far would you want to crank some of these knobs before uh, in order to get things moving faster than the decade two decades it might take otherwise thank you mayor and council members absolutely that conversation will i think be very easily dovetailed with our intent to uh, discuss this compliance program that we're working on standing up uh, we want to talk to developers and their property managers especially on that compliance program and i think we can plug this right in as that discussion on how far the incentives would need to go to make that work. Um, we have been in conversation with a developer who really emphasized the the inflation and interest rate situation that we're in now has been quite prohibitive in terms of that deep affordability. So that's a challenge that might be out of our uh, control, but hopefully can improve and that will allow us to go more aggressively seeking these deep affordability developments. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even just briefly, even beyond deep affordability, I even mean curiosity for uh, market rate that would include the minimum percentage mm -hmm. of affordable units. I mean, just development in general to knock down some of these old kind of gross strip malls. How much flexibility would we need to make that happen? And maybe it's too much. But yeah. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Councilmember Martin. Councilmember Carter? Uh, thank you. So a couple of years ago, <clears throat> well, not a couple of years ago, 2018, 2019, there were a couple of kind of high profile um, uh, projects that happened where NOAA properties were flipped and turned into market rate and it displaced, you know, hundreds of people and families. And I feel like at that time there was a lot of focus and conversation on NOAA properties, but I don't feel like we've really focused on, on them as much or at least talked about that in a public way. And so I do appreciate in the um, Met Council goals table, you have the 80% AMI NOAA, and I think that's... Um, indicating where we've helped to preserve NOAA units. And it just makes me wonder, you know, as we think about this 30% AMI range, um, like my instinct would be that there's a huge opportunity there to make sure we're preserving the units we already have available at that 30% or 50% AMI. But I don't really know, you know, how many 30% AMI units do we have in Bloomington right now? And are they at risk of... Um, you know, being redeveloped, and what do we need to do to proactively uh, make sure that they're being preserved um, and work with, you know, building owners, you know, if they're thinking of selling because they have too many maintenance issues or whatever the problem is, like, could we offer incentives through our affordable housing trust fund to help them improve their property while not then, you know, jacking up rates for their tenants? So, I guess that's something that I'm thinking about as we think about the 30% and 50%. And I don't know if that helps us hit our Met Council goals, if preserving helps go toward these numbers, but um, it feels like um, you know a realistic path forward. And not that others aren't, but um, you know, preserving what we have is, I feel like, going to be really important as we move forward. Uh, so that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mary and Council. Yes, absolutely. I would to your point of how many 30% AMI units are out there, I think we can get that understanding from our rental survey, which is something that we've done in the past, in addition to our annual housing report, which the HRA prepares. That report partners with CoStar, which is a real estate company that is able to get access to those uh, the data that uh, is backing for what those rental uh, prices are set at. So taking a close look at that data is very helpful. And then your point on um, reaching out, doing, doing some outreach uh, to residential landlords. So I'll mention again, what we're seeing is a lot of the those NOAA units are less than 20 units. In fact, they're closer to four units or less. And so that is HRA, uh, HRA's purview, not that OHO doesn't quite trigger. We do have our tenant protection ordinance, but that's for, again, those um, more unit buildings. But I will mention Erica Coleman is um, talking about um, interest in a residential re rental rehab program or some type of program. We have our existing CDBG funded homeowner rehab program, which is very well utilized and appreciated, but getting something in place for um, those rental units as well is important. So there's an opportunity with that, some of that state funding coming in to perhaps put it toward that use. Very good. Council, I'm going to move us along here uh, really quickly, Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to check in in terms of preservation of uh, existing units, if staff was comfortable or if they reviewed what happened in Duluth with a project that um, 
the developer after the start of the project converted some of the market rate units into short-term rentals or boutique hotel and so now there's a legal dispute going on between them about whether or not they could do that because they did preserve the uh, affordable units within the project but they didn't meet the original project goals and so i just want to make sure that that is not something that could happen here because i think housing units are important um you know if someone wants to build a hotel obviously the city of bloomington has been you know, very open to that idea throughout the years, but um, not a conversion of residential units into that use. So that's all I got. Thanks for bringing that up, council member. Thank you, Mayor Council. I just wanted to respond and say, I, I'm not aware of that project, but I will say in the OHO as written, there is a, a requirement to put some uh, tools in place for units that receive our funding to remain affordable in perpetuity. So whether that be a deed restriction, a covenant, some sort of rider that goes along with those units, that would be in place to ensure some long-term affordability. I believe that it, I mean, this would be something for me to review, um, whether or not it drills down onto that short-term rental question of, of whether or not that'd be an allowable use. So thank you for that. Yep, thank you. And just for clarification, they did not convert the affordable units they converted the market rate units, and that was their argument um, that they could do that. And I would just make sure our um, development agreements don't allow for that if, if that was some type of loophole that might exist. Thank you, Mr. Niemeyer. Good information and good discussion, Council. Thanks much. And that will bring us to item 5.2 tonight. Another discussion. This is on our 102nd Street Traffic and School Safety project or evaluation or consideration or discussion i'm not sure what the, a little a little, a little of all those above. things yeah good. so good evening mayor and council members so over the past year we um had some approvals come through council for a project on 102nd street at the Olson middle school driveway that along with a couple of crashes really kind of brought some awareness um, from residents to the council of um, some of the school traffic issues that happened on 102nd Street. Um, the council asked staff to come back just to provide an opportunity for discussion. So tonight I'll cover a little bit of the history of what's gone on on this section of 102nd Street, as, long as, as well as um, the current conditions out there and some recommended next steps. So you'll see we're talking about 102nd Street between Normandale Boulevard and France Avenue. On this section of roadway, we have um, three schools. We've got Jefferson High School, Olson Middle School, and Olson Elementary School. It's a four-lane undivided roadway. To the, um, to the west, we have converted that existing four-lane roadway into a three-lane. And to, to the far west, um, we have converted from a four-lane to a two-lane historically. So here's some, some background. So there have been um, a couple of previous opportunities where we have studied 102nd Street with our Collector Street Striping Reconfiguration Program starting back in 2009 and then again in 2014. Um, at those times, there were some proposals and recommendations to convert from a four lane to a three lane. However, with the peak concentration um, of times and traffic at the schools, um, the striping changes do have to have some infrastructure improvements made with them, which um, would include right turn bays into the school or some modification of how the schools function at Jefferson High School, the circulation. And so both of those proposals were, um, were not recommended to be moved forward or were not approved by the council. Um, we also um, did specific study at Olson School Driveway starting back in 2013. And the outcome of that study is that project that you saw is that just finished getting constructed, the Olson Driveway um, Driver and Pedestrian Safety Improvement Project. A um, couple other projects that we have done. So we've done several pedestrian crossing improvements along um, along 102nd Street, as well as on Kell and Old Shakopee Road and on France Avenue at Heritage Hills. So these are all considered safe routes to school projects that have improved pedestrian access to and around the schools. Um, but what we're still left with is the four-lane undivided cross-section on 102nd Street. So 
little bit more of conditions. So the, the volumes on 102nd Street range between 5,000 vehicles per day on the Normandale end up to 6,700 vehicles per day on the France Avenue end. The, um, the posted speed limit currently is 35 miles an hour, and the 85th percentile speeds are between 35 and 38 miles per hour. Um, we'll talk more about speed limits. All right, so at the council meeting last Monday, the council approved the neighborhood traffic management plan. And with that plan, it approved um, speed limit modifications on all local roadways. 102nd Street is a collector street, and at, at that meeting, the council also directed staff to start looking at speed limit recommendations for collector and arterial roadways in Bloomington. So um, one of the challenges, or one of the things that we will be addressing, but it, it is a little bit challenging, is the fact that the school campuses span a half mile section. So. Um, getting some very specific speed reduction through signage in a school area is going to be a little tricky. Um, just our preliminary look at it, we would likely propose some very specific zones. So I do want to say that that is in the works. We will be looking at that and, and considering that along with the speed reduction changes for the collector streets. And that's all in development and will be coming to the council. So to talk about crashes, um, first of all, I just wanted to show, so this is a graphic that shows crash data from 2021 to present. This is based on our call log to the police department, not on crashes reported to the state. So typically the, the calls that come into the police department are higher, so I want to make sure that that is reflected here. You'll see we do have some interspersed throughout the entire corridor. Obviously, the concentration is at the signalized intersections at France Avenue and at Normandale Boulevard. The, um, right in the middle is the Olson driveway with the two crashes. This is two and a half years worth of data. It really just represents that um, one crash per year that, that we had been seeing for years and years at that driveway location that we think that the safety improvements that were built this year will really help to address. All right, and I really don't want to get too into the weeds on crash data. There's a lot of different ways to report crashes. Just wanted to give a little perspective on those higher um, crash numbers at the intersection. So at Normandale Boulevard, this is a, a crash rate that's provided by Hennepin County. This is a three years worth of crash data, 0.36. So that's crash per million entering vehicles at the intersection. Um, and then if you compare that, so that average crash rate, Hennepin County, that is of similar intersections throughout Hennepin County, that would be the average crash rate. So um, with this three years worth of data, Normandale Boulevard was a little below the average crash rate and France Avenue was a little above the average crash rate. Um, we also do uh, tracking of crashes on all of the Bloomington intersections, and we always measure those in five years worth of data. Um, it looks a little different um, if we were to rank all of them based on just crash rate. Um, Normandale falls about ranking number 14th in crash rate, and France Avenue is about 20th. So I really just tell you that so that you understand that none of these are in the top 10, but they are in the top 25. All right, so that's a lot of a lot of things going on. There's a lot of peak concentration of traffic on this corridor. A lot of things have been tried. We have made a lot of improvements, and I would call them low-hanging fruit, but none of them were easy so far. However, I think that the next steps really will involve um, infrastructure changes and likely right-of-way acquisition. And so. We don't want to jump ahead and say we know a solution. We really think that this corridor calls for a full study with the public engagement process and a planned development. And we would include in that study um, site circulation for Jefferson campus, um, speed limits and school speed zone on 102nd Street and Johnson Avenue. Uh, the intersection design at France Avenue and 102nd Street. We know that could benefit from some turn lanes. It could possibly benefit from a completely different intersection design. A roundabout may be a good fit there. Um, we definitely would like to see that big, huge channelized right go away. So there's a lot of things that need to be done there. There's nothing that's an easy or obvious solution. So that would be 
a, a positive outcome of the study. Um, the intersection design at Normandale and 100 second, I do want to note that we are going to try to make as many of the safety improvements that we have identified are needed out there with the upcoming trails project in that area. So those are in 2024 and 2025. We would still include it in the study just to see if there's anything else that's needed as a corridor wide. And then um, right turn or lane configuration on 100 Second Street, possibly the four lane to a three lane conversion and what else needs to happen to make that happen. And then active transportation facilities both on and, on and off road on the corridor. So how do we get that study? So first step would be to identify funding for the study. Second is to complete the study and third is to apply for infrastructure grants. Um, some options for trying to identify and timing for a study. So there are a lot of grant opportunities available that are, keep coming out from MnDOT. Um, the MnDOT Active Transportation Planning Assistance Grant is um, they're opening another solicitation in fall of 2023. I discussed with their staff and they seem like they indicated that this seems like it could potentially be a candidate project for that type of an application. There's also a specific Safe Routes to School Planning Assistance Grant. Um, they have pushed back their solicitation for that until fall of 2024. Other funding options, um, we could consider strategic priorities. Um, if we do have an engineering studies budget, it is already programmed out till at least in 2025. And um, we would like to update our district wide safe routes to school plan, had that tentatively slated in for 2025 as well. So there'd be a little bit of conflicting interest there, but of course those are all options. Once we get that study funded, I would love to complete it in like the 2024, 2025 school year. I think that that would work in on our staffing workload. Um, we think that there we, we would definitely need a stakeholder group. So there's, these are both Hennepin County intersections. We're gonna need to really demonstrate the need for a project and, and build their support through the whole process along with the entire neighborhood, of course. Um, and then apply for infrastructure grants. I mean, this is a time that is ripe with funding for these types of projects. We'd really love to take advantage of it right away. However, the really critical step is to get a good plan and make sure that we are applying for the right project for the neighborhood. Um, I did just want to mention some other safe routes to school projects because, you know, we've given a lot of attention to this area. Still more is needed. Um, we have done safe routes to school projects across the entire city, and we really just kind of are, have, effect, have touched all of the schools with improvements. Um, some that you will see coming up shortly, Kennedy, Kennedy High School, um, they have a, a pretty high pedestrian crossing demand on Old Shakopee. Um, so just to the east of Nicollet Avenue, so we're proposing, or we have received funding um, from a highway safety improvement program um, grant to work on building a project there in 2024. And then we've also received some safe routes to school funding to build around Valley View Elementary and Middle School, some new sidewalk on East 88th Street, and then some additional enhancements to that really heavily used crossing on Portland Avenue at 88th Street. And then I've already mentioned our desire to update our 2012 Comprehensive Safe Routes to School Plan. With that, I will answer any questions. This is really intended as a kind of providing the update to the council and an opportunity for discussion, um, some feedback on, on what's proposed. Thank you much. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for this. This is great. Um, <clears throat> I, I have a quick question. Do you have a a sense for you know plus or minus twenty percent the amount of funding you're looking to 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 secure here for this particular study? Mr. Mayor, Council Member D'Alessandro, um, I was thinking about it beforehand, and you know we know exact we know what we think would we'd want studied. I don't have it within 20%, but I think this is between a sixty dollars and $120,000 study. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. Appreciate okay. it. So it, in other words, Mr. Mayor, it's not a lot of, I mean, do those, do you, does anybody know, do those grants that you would apply for, would they cover all of that? Would they cover some of that? Would we have to do a match? What's the, what's the general perspective on that? 
Mr. Mayor and Councilmember Council D'Alessandro, so we were successful in receiving an active transportation action planning grant. Um, those These planning assistance grants are not awarded directly to the city. So the MnDOT under those programs, historically, they have hired consulting services and then cities have been successful in receiving those consulting services. So they put an estimated value of, I think it was like 30,000 on the, on the last one we received for active transportation. So Mr. Mayor, if my doing my math correctly, let's say, let's say between those two grants, they funded 50%, we would be looking for something between 30 and 60,000 out of these other kind of city specific resources to, to complete the project. Generally speaking, I think that that's valuable. I mean, we, we've heard from everyone that this is a strategic priority for the city, especially around our schools. So I feel comfortable with that. Not that they're asking for specific direction, but I don't see any reason not to proceed. My personal take. Yep, Thanks. Appreciate, appreciate the input. Uh, Councilmember Mua and then Councilmember Nelson. Councilmember Mua. Thank you, Mayor. The biggest thing for me as I've dug into this <clears throat> is that this has come back to this particular stretch of 100 second has come to council two or three times and has failed two or three times. And so I want to make sure that we are absolutely engaging fully the neighborhood as much as possible to bring this along, given that this has failed multiple times already. And so I would hate for us to invest this money, do this study, propose this, and then have the neighborhood come back again and be against what we're proposing. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're very focused on that, making sure that the neighborhood is understanding exactly what's going on, getting their input, um, so that we can finally move something forward for something that's been going on for 20 years. Thanks. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just a few qu quick questions. Uh, one for clarification. Does the crash rate data include pedestrian accidents? I know there's been some at France in the last couple of years. So Mr. Mayor, Councilwoman Nelson, so that cr the crash numbers that you were seeing included all incidents, could include pedestrians or vehicles. Okay. Um, looking at the timeline of spring of next year or sometime next year, um, how would we model or, or think through the potential impacts to traffic from what Jefferson or the school district is looking at for a stadium there? Um, they're looking at stadiums at both of the schools that will have a huge traffic impact on 102nd there. How do we incorporate that into there? Because, I mean, to my understanding, it won't be there yet when we would study it. So, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Nelson, that's an excellent question. <laughs> Thank you. That's the only answer I needed. <laughs> so, I'm just going to add to that too. So, um, if they come forth with a stadium a proposal, something specific as they work through this, traffic impacts, uh, the effects of traffic, people circulating, and that'll be a study of that will be part of that. Um, and then, how would we mix that into the, just the general background day to day traffic? That would also be factored in. Um, the, I think the issues affecting 102nd Street are much more centered around just the day-to-day -day things, people getting into school and so on and so forth. So any large stadium like that would come with its own set of issues and traffic studies to address just what's happening with that stadium. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the concerns that uh, I heard from previous uh, previously that, that led to maybe not moving forward with this is that there would have to be changes at the entrances to the schools. Do the changes that were recently made at Olson um, help and assist at least with that location? Councilmember Nelson, yep, that design took into account the possibility of a future three-lane expansion. So it is a full added right turn bay um, um, des length designed for anticipated future volumes as well. Okay, so that was part of the thought process there, great. Um, Last question, or just thought on this, is um, I assume that the study would not only look at a vehicular traffic, but also pedestrian. There are concerns about walking, um, not only crossing the Normandale, France, and all of that, but um, just on the sidewalk in general. I think, it, if I recall correctly, it's one of the narrower ones, and there are uh, several areas that, that ice up pretty bad in the winter and things like that. Would it take that holistic view? of the councilmember nelson yep that would definitely all be included in the scope okay. fantastic thank you Councilmember member loman 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, reading my mind here. I, did have just to, cause, I mean, I believe I was here in 2014 when we, we did this. And so to Councilmember Mua's point, uh, why did that fail? I just, I can't, I mean, I remember the neighborhood being very, you know, very opposed to it. I know, I remember 106th Street being right around that same period of time and we did the one and didn't do the other one. And I know folks were very, very upset on 106th Street. You know, and it's proven to be um, a lot safer on 106th Street. I mean, I, I drive that more often now. And so I'm, you know, I, so if you could just, you know, if you could go back in time and remind us. <laughs> Oh, what, what were you thinking? Um, or? Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Lohman, so there was a lot of public engagement with that process. There were a lot of concerns from, from some of the neighbors that um, going from a four-lane to a three-lane was going to increase congestion, and they had a, a difficult time seeing the safety benefits of that to a left turn lane. And I will say one thing that seemed to be pretty influential in the council's decision was the fact that right away acquisition was needed um, to add a right turn bay at Jefferson High School and um, it, resulting in some sidewalk reconstruction and it would be would have been closer to somebody's home. And so I think along with that was a loss of some trees that correct uh, played into that conversation as well. Gosh, it just seems... You know, when you think about all those accidents that have happened there, if we could have done something, you know, wow. I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I was supportive or not of it. I don't think I was, but uh, gosh, now it just, you know, gosh, <laughs> just kind of, you know, oof. years later you go, wow, why, why do we, why do we do that? Um, yeah, I have the same fear that this might get whipped up again. And so, um, but, uh, you know, I just, you know, as we look at the other, I know the mayor, you've mentioned this in the past, of looking at 106th Street and some of the other streets that we've made the conversions to, um, of going to that and, and bringing some of that data forward, um, since we have a lot more information around that. And I don't know what this is similar to, I think would be very helpful as we kind of, I know this is kind of unique and every every neighborhood is unique. And, you know, I believe my neighborhood is, you know, more unique than any other neighborhood in the entire country, which that is not true. <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, but I just, you know, if there's some similarities there uh, that make sense. But yeah, I, I totally would support us looking at some strategic, uh, you know, priority dollars. If, if that's something that I know we're going to have that conversation later on, uh, if that makes sense. Um, and um, I guess this time will just be a little more more gutsy when it, when it when it comes up here in terms of what we need to do for our, our, our school children that are coming through this intersection. So. Council, anything else on this? Well, I do think uh, with the next steps to identify the funding for the study, I you know take into account Councilmember D'Alessandro's comments. I think that's that's a good direction, and and the um, and the commitment this council has towards safety, especially around the schools and the discussion, the, the whole discussion we had over the last few years and especially last week with our traffic safety uh, program. So look forward to seeing this continue. Appreciate the discussion and guidance. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Council, that brings us to our last item of the evening, item 5.3, our city council policy and issue update. I will kick us off and uh, recap our listening session tonight. We had one speaker, Dick Katasik, talked about Bryant Park, had a series of questions about the placement of the activities, uh, what the master plan looked like, uh, whether or not they'd be able to weigh in, the neighborhood would be able to weigh in before the master plan became final. He had good questions, and what I appreciate is that Renee Clark from our planning or from our parks team was there. And I think as I was walking down here, they were meeting and looking at the master plan that we were talking about. Uh, so once again, I mean, th this idea of a listening session that is a back and forth and then results in some uh, interaction and some hopefully uh, good discussions and, and ultimately a resolution to people's questions, it's kind of what we were aiming for. And it looks like it's working, and, and I appreciate that. And that saw it very, we saw it very clearly tonight, and I really did appreciate the fact that Renee was there, and I appreciate the questions that the neighborhood has brought the last couple of weeks, and I hope we can answer those questions for them. The only other thing that I have this evening, uh, I had the opportunity last night to hear a presentation by the Prime Minister of Somalia, Mr. Hazma Abdi Bari, and uh, it was a good-sized gather gathering over at the, uh, the where was it, the Doubletree? Mm -hmm. Yep, at the Doubletree, 
a lot of folks there. A lot of enthusiasm it went late into the night, but it was uh, it was a good gathering and um, community building event for for the Somali community for the Twin Cities, but especially here in Bloomington. It was I had the opportunity to say hello to the crowd. Uh, Mayor of Eden Prairie, Ron Case, was there also, and he said hello first and got the cheers from Eden Prairie. So I, of course, tried to one-up him with the cheers from Bloomington, and there were a lot of Bloomington folks there. And uh, they were appreciative of the opportunity to to host the prime minister here in Bloomington. It, we don't often get a prime minister to come to, to Bloomington, and it's great to see. Appreciate um, Hennepin County Sheriff's Office. The sheriff uh, did a great job coordinating security, worked very closely with Bloomington Police, Bloomington Fire were there as well. They worked very closely with Secret Service. This is not a small operation when a prime minister comes, and it went off without a hitch, and they did a great job. And so just wanted to tip my hat to the organizi organizers, to the public safety folks who made it all work, and uh, to the to the prime minister for choosing to come to, to Bloomington of all places. I mean, I think he was in New York at the United Nations earlier in the week and came to Bloomington after that. So it was, it was pretty impressive. So... That is my update. Mr. Verbrugge, anything to add this evening? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, just reporting out a couple events from last week. Uh, Friday I had uh, uh, the opportunity to attend the State of the Airport Luncheon, which is hosted by the MSP Airport Foundation. It's an annual report similar to the Mayor's State of the City, uh, talking about uh, all of the activity and the benefits that the airport brings to our community. It was uh, extremely well attended at the Intercontinental Hotel and a celebration of the fact that Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport uh, continues to be an important uh, asset for this region, uh, that it is uh, annually rated as the uh, best, if not second best, according to recent news, uh, airport in all of North America, and uh, really deserves recognition for the amount of uh, effort it is putting into its artistic expression, making sure that the traveler experience is uh, positive and calming uh, and uh, taking a lot of action to, to make people feel at home as they transit through uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport, obviously, is a uh, hub airport. There are an awful lot of people who come through here um, uh, who are neither originating or, or uh, concluding their uh, travel in Minneapolis-St. Paul, uh, and the airport provides uh, really wonderful amenities for them. Also good to note that uh, uh, enplanements at the airport last year uh, were uh, cl over $39 million, which is very close to the record that was uh, set back in 2019 pre-COVID. And so they're hoping they're on track to actually exceed 40 million emplanements for the first time ever. Uh, if not this year, then perhaps next year. Also celebrated a number of new um, uh, routes and airlines that are coming into the area. Lufthansa has never operated here before. They are establishing a Frankfurt route uh, in the spring of next year. Uh, and uh, uh, Aer Lingus is bringing back their Dublin route uh, and the... Um, uh, South Korea, or the, sorry, the Korea route, we call it Korea, it's not South Korea. The Seoul route is uh, uh, being initiated again for Delta. So uh, it is easier to get many places in the world than it has been ever before uh, from this airport. So again, very positive news. Uh, we as a community benefit from our uh, proximity to and relationship with the airport uh, uh, economically uh, in terms of ease of access for our residents. And so uh, continuing to have a strong partnership with the airport is, uh, is uh, very important for us. So appreciated that opportunity. Also wanted to uh, thank our community development director who organized a little tour for several of us staff last week uh, with Mr. Yusuf Ali to go over to the Zawadi Center. Uh, this is the community center the council approved some time ago uh, at 1701 American Boulevard. Uh, it was repurposing some uh, office warehouse space into a community center uh, uh, space uh, that will bring um, uh, 
community together for business purposes, for uh, leisure and hospitality, for gathering rooms. And I just wanted to comment that they have done a first-class job in, in developing that space. The Nomadic Cafe uh, is very warm and welcoming. The Zawadi Restaurant is opening, I believe today was actually their first day. Uh, so I would encourage uh, folks to go check that out. My understanding is that it's fusion um, uh, East African and Latin food. So it uh, seems uh, very interesting and nice addition to the community. Uh, the spaces are uh, very nicely um, decorated and, and uh, nicely appointed. So uh, a nice um, celebration and, and uh, success story within our community uh, and appreciate our community development staff for their work to facilitate that. Thank you, Mr. Brugge. <laughs> Councilmember Carter. And then Councilmember Loma, Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So um, Councilmember Nelson mentioned the stadium conversations at uh, Jefferson, and I know those conversations are happening now at both high schools um, with the ending of the lease at the Lincoln football field. And so I guess I'm just curious, you know, what is the city's role as the school district plans these new stadium facilities? I think that the... I think there might be a planning commission item coming up in October related to them. Um, but just really, you know, we've been talking about wanting to continue to work an even stronger partner with, partnership with the school district. And so how can we be as supportive as possible, um, knowing that, you know, both high schools need these facilities. Uh, and then the other part of this, too, is um, that I know I've gotten the question multiple times, what's going to happen with the Lincoln football field? And I think there's a lot of um, confusion in the community about who owns it and the city's role in it and you know so I guess I would be curious and it doesn't have to be now but at some point in the future um, you know does the city have any kind of say or influence in what happens to that that Lincoln football field I mean I think there's probably a lot of people in the community have who have very strong feelings um, just from a historical perspective and what that means to them um, but I also know a lot of the athletic um, organizations there's you know, different conversations happening because they would love it to be a dome mm -hmm. uh, for winter use. So anyways, just curious for an update on, you know, what's happening there and what's our role and how we can be supportive of the school district and the community as they figure those plans out. Mr. Berugi, anything off the cuff here? Or? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Carter, uh, as of uh, this time, the district leadership has not made any specific request of us in terms of providing support for their uh, engagement and, and information sharing efforts. Uh, I'll certainly talk to Superintendent Melby and uh, see if there uh, is something that we can do, if nothing else, just to amplify uh, the efforts that they are getting out and to work within the community to make sure people understand what the proposal is and uh, get as much uh, community input as they possibly can. Regarding the uh, the, the potential fate of the, the Lincoln football field over at 90th and uh, in the area of 90th and Penn, I guess that's Queen that it's actually on, um, that is owned by the school district. Uh, the city does not have uh, a role in that property, and uh, it, uh, to this date we have not had any conversation about what disposition of that property might look like if the school district is successful in, um, in, in developing uh, facilities in other places. So uh, nothing to report in that regard. So I'll report back after talking to Dr. Melby. Councilmember Member Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> so two items are not necessarily looking for a response today because I don't want to put staff or other council members on, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, ask for something right today. But um, I, uh, the item I had uh, not held earlier, uh, 3.2, the amendment to the Human Rights Commission uh, rules of procedure. Um, I do know that we had a number of, you know, I don't just want to say incidents, but you know, some resignations and some other uh, things that happened over the year uh, with that. And I'm just as we get towards, um, I don't know if I've talked with other council members, we, you know, and other council members have brought this forward. So we get ready to work towards the work plan. Um, I just am hoping that um, that uh, the manager and staff uh, leadership can can kind of work through some some items there with that particular commission to make sure that they're kind of aligned with uh, kind of where this council is uh, going or at least have that conversation. I don't know if that makes sense for the council to have that conversation or where that conversation should lie, but we just want to make sure, at least this council member wants to make sure that we uh, 
are being very proactive and just making sure that uh, that the leaders on that, uh, whether the chair or those folks who are part of that uh, commission, have real clear uh, leadership kind of moving forward uh, with that human rights commission. And then um, secondarily, um, uh, I think it'd be interesting uh, for us to get a kind of an update on the Veterans Memorial uh, in terms of where we're at uh, with that. Um, in terms of you know what's going on with that, I know they've got some events that are coming up at some point. I don't, I'm not as directly as involved with that. I just happened to run into a couple of people who are working on that <laughs> over the weekend um, during family time, uh, and uh, it'd be interesting to hear a little more of an update in terms of where we're at and where that's uh, where that's going. Um, uh, so, uh, whenever some, uh, if anybody has anything to say about that, I'd love to hear about that. And then. Um, uh, uh, you know, we kind of talk about being more of an international city. Uh, you know, last week, uh, or last time we met, we had the mayor talk about the, the trip to Japan, and then tonight, Mary talked about the uh, Somalia piece, uh, having the, the representatives from there coming. But I wonder if the city manager would, would uh, uh, talk a little bit about a Rotary initiative um, that we've got going on in the city in terms of making us a, um, a, a bid uh, of be a possible Rotary International City. Um, I know you were uh, working on some of that today, and uh, uh, there's that possibility of us uh, expanding that international piece. Mr. Ripper. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Lohman, uh, uh, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Uh, Rotary International is a membership organization of 1.4 million people around the world. It's been uh, active since about 1905, was founded in... Uh, Chicago, and their first convention was actually held in 1930 in Chicago, and the 100th anniversary uh, convention will be held in 2030 in Chicago. So it's a it's a vibrant uh, organization of people aligned to do good things in the world, focused around seven causes uh, that are uh, uh, humanitarian in nature, improving uh, living conditions like clean water and sanitation whatnot. Um, so uh, they have an annual convention internationally. Uh, the most recent one was in Melbourne, Australia. The next ones are in Singapore, Calgary, um, Taipei, and Honolulu, and Manila, which gets us to 2029, which has not been filled yet. Uh, Minneapolis is one of two finalists, along with San Francisco, to host the 2029 Rotary International Convention. Uh, I'm, I'm the co-chair of our bid committee. Uh, I want to be clear, I'm doing this in my capacity as a Rotary member, not as a city staff person, so time that I'm uh, spending on it is my own time. I'm not charging city time to do that, but we have the site selection committee in town this week, uh, and they will be uh, spending a number of days here to understand what the Minneapolis proposal is. Uh, and how we plan to welcome somewhere between 17 and 25,000 people uh, in 2029 from around the world. Really wonderful opportunity to put Minneapolis on the map globally uh, and, <clears throat> again, demonstrate that we are a uh, worldwide destination, uh, that we are very good at hosting large events like this, and that we have a lot to offer uh, to people of the world everywhere. And um, hoping that we'll be successful, we'll find out in January. Manager, thank you for that that brief update. And if I may just say, uh, uh, Councilmember Chicardi is quite the sharp dresser tonight. <laughs> Councilmember D'Alessandro. Well, those are all fun updates, Mr. Mayor. I had one uh, kind of uh, cost, uh, <clears throat> constituent complaint that kind of came up, but I just wanted to, to kind of bring up an aggregate over the course of the last um, – three weeks or so, I've heard a number of folks, well, this probably goes back a little bit further. We seem to be having a, a, a run of um, issues related to folks doing uh, contract utility work or other things like that in the area who end up damaging like local property or um, other things like that. And then we don't have, we don't have a, um, we don't seem to have a mechanism to make it easy for folks to get remedy from that. And I, um, whether you're talking about there's some fiber to the curb stuff happening and there's been some co concerns in my area Obviously, the sod situation with some of the CenturyLink stuff and even our own curb and gutter stuff has been problematic. I'm just – I don't know if there's 
uh, if there's a, a current clause or anything, but what is our what is our um, what do we obligate people who do that kind of work in the city to in terms of like you know the care and feeding of the property that you know we as residents so I'll put on my homeowner hat we as residents have to like enable mm -hmm. folks to get to that right of way all the time right um it we but we're responsible for all the maintenance and all the upkeep and all that kind of stuff and then people come in and do that work in that right of way and they butcher the what you know the good work that's been done and then there's no remedy and so what is our obligation to those utilities if any and and can we strengthen or lengthen the obligation that they have to actually, you know, basically put things back the way they were, if possible. I'm just curious. I, I don't know anything about it. And I bring it up not so much to answer the question today, but to just try to understand if we have an opportunity to help our residents and, and homeowners do get a little bit better service sure. as a result of that. Thanks. Sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Del Desando. So I'll try to be quick with this because it actually gives me an opportunity to talk about a couple things. Um, first of all, you're right. We have had an inordinate amount of uh, right-of-way work that's going on this year uh, that's picking up. We have a number of companies that are working in the uh, fiber uh, sector uh, that are laying fiber all over town. Uh, for, for whatever reason, there's been a pickup in that uh, particular business, and everybody's trying to be the first ones in the dirt. And uh, what we're experiencing is uh, an awful lot of um, uh, struck lines and uh, not just our our systems, but also the, the public utilities are experiencing the same frustration. Um, so uh, what what uh, is required of them, I'm going to ask Julie Long, our city engineer, sitting back there to start making her way to the microphone to give you a quick <laughs> overview. But while she's doing that, I also want to mention that uh, while I was at the airport luncheon on Friday, I was talking to Michelle Swanson, who is our XL Energy Community Sector Rep, uh, about the changes that the council made to our um, right-of-way permitting process and the, the fees associated with them and sharing back to you her appreciation for the council doing that because um, that uh, fee structure is uh, being very um, uh, welcomed by them as, as something that's helping them get their projects done better and more cost efficiently. Um, so that was some positive feedback for something that you've done, but I want to give Julie an opportunity to talk about what the requirement is when somebody's working in our right of way for, um, for restoring, uh, the right of way after they've worked, but also remedying, remedying any uh, damage that's incurred in that process. Mr. Mayor, Council Member D'Alessandro, um, all of the private utility companies are obligated to get a permit from us and their obligation is to restore the existing grass. We do not have an obligation if you have perennials or other shrubs to restore those. Um, but we are struggling, as you have seen and as you have heard, with some of these new fiber companies. Um, they're new to us. We don't have good long-standing relationships with them. So unlike a lot of our other complaints, if we get a complaint from an Excel Energy customer or a CenterPoint Energy customer, we already know who their restoration contractor is. We can put them in contact with them. If it is not resolved appropriately, we know all the people to contact to get them resolved. With these fiber companies, we don't have that relationship, so we're working on improving that. You also mentioned that sometimes we have these same com com comments from the public on our pavement management program. Um, our standard warranty is 30 days, so from when we put down the sod, it's rooted in usually at 30 days, so it has a good chance of survival. But I will tell you, um, sod is, I always call it, it's like a toddler. Just because it's a baby and it's, everything's good, you still have to parent it and baby it along for another three years. So we've had droughts. So it needs more water than the rest of the yard. So if the, your rest of your yard was planted in the 70s, 80s, you know, this new stuff will need additional water in comparison to the old stuff. Um, so that's one little historical thing. But I also, um, Jack Distel with our water resources group is working on a native planting group, um, a contract, and I told him, 
put in some sod restoration in there so that when we get the complaints, we have a mechanism because we can't go back to our contractor the way our specif specification is written to get them to fix the thing. So it'd be nice to have an on-call person. So, But as soon as you touch one on the block, you have to be prepared to touch all of them on the block. So it may be added some, some added expense. Right. I appreciate the update on that, and, and I, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm just not 100% sure people you know, know what their obligations are, right? And so maybe part of it is just an, an outreach. I'm hoping that maybe we don't permit those fiber folks until they learn not to do what they're doing right now. But um, that, so I know you have some carrots and sticks to work with there. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is an, an example. I'm in the neighborhood in 82nd and Upton area, right? They got their carbon gutter two years ago. Sod was good for about a year because we went through and we actually did watering and then, you know, it started to fail and they're just wondering what to do about it. Right. And so, um, I, I get it, but we, we also charge people for their water. And so what we're, what we're, it's kind of a hard, you know, it, it, in aggregate, it becomes really hard. We say, yeah, we'll warranty it for 30 days and then it's on you. And oh, by the way, with a drought, you're going to have to spend more water and oh, we're going to update the water charges. And so you're going to spend more. And it's just like, it's really hard to manage people's expectations around that stuff. And so no, no judgment there as much as to say like, this is another area where climate mitigation strategies maybe need to be in, in brought in. Maybe it's a more drought tolerant sod that we put down, or it's, you know, there's some other things that we may need to look at in the, in the event because we're going to continue to do curb and gutter and we're going to continue to do overlays and things like that. So thank you. I appreciate you letting me bring it up. And uh, if there's anything we need to approve to, to strengthen that relationship on permitting or anything, please don't, I would be supportive of it is what I'm getting to. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Council, is there anything else for the good of the order this evening? Seeing no hands up, Council, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion and a second to adjourn tonight. No further council discussion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Thanks much, Council, for the discussion. Thanks to the staff for your work. And thank you for everybody who tuned in this evening. Have a good rest of your week.